Chapters 22 and 23 of Rose Mather, A Tale, by Mary Jane Holmes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 22. The Wounded Soldier Widow Sims was going to the army, and Jimmy Carlton, who was coming home for a few weeks, was to be her escort to Washington. During the summer, Jimmy had seen a good deal of hard service. He had been in no general battle, but had taken part in several skirmishes and raids, in one of which he received a severe flesh wound in his arm which, together with a sprained ankle, confined him for a time to the hospital, and finally procured for him a furlough of three or four weeks. Rose was delighted, and this time the federal flag was actually floating from the cupola of the Mather mansion in honor of Jimmy's return, but there was no crowd at the depot to welcome him that custom was worn out and only the mather carriage was waiting for jimmy whose right arm was in a sling and whose face looked pale and thin from his recent confinement in hospital altogether he was very interesting in his character as a wounded soldier rose thought as she made an impetuous rush at him nearly strangling him with her vehement joy at having him home again and jimmy was very glad to see her glad too to meet his mother but his eyes kept constantly watching the door and wandering down the hall as if in quest of someone who did not come during the weary days he had passed in the georgetown hospital annie graham's face had been constantly with him and as he watched the tall wiry figure of the nurse who always wore a sunbonnet and had a pin between her teeth he kept wishing that it was annie and even worked himself into a passion against his sister rose who in one of her letters had spoken of annie's proposal to offer herself as nurse and her violent opposition to the plan if rose had minded her business annie might possibly have been in this very ward instead of that old maid from massachusetts who looks for all the world like those awful good women in boston who don't wear hoops and who distribute tracts on sundays in the vicinity of cornhill why can't a woman look decent and distribute tracts too annie in her black dress with her hair done up somehow would do more good to us poor invalids than forty strong-minded females in pasteboard bonnets with an everlasting pin between their teeth thus jimmy fretted about rose and the massachusetts woman who in spite of her big pin and pasteboard bonnet brought him many a nice dish of tea or bowl of soup until the order came for him to go home when with an alacrity which almost belied the languor and weakness he had complained of so bitterly he packed his valise and started again for rockland this time he wore the army blue but the suit which at first had been so fresh and clean was soiled and worn and hateful to the fastidious young man who only endured it because he fancied it might in some way commend him to annie graham rose had written that she worshipped the very name of a soldier especially if he were a poor private her sympathies being specially enlisted for that class of people and jimmy was a poor private and a wounded one at that with his arm in a sling and a cane in his hand and his curly hair cut short and his coat all wrinkled and soiled and his knapsack on his back and he was going home to annie who surely would welcome him now and hold his hand a moment and possibly dress his wound that would be delightful and jimmy's blood went tingling through his veins as he felt in fancy the soft touch of annie's fingers upon his flesh and saw her head crowned with the pale brown hair bending over him he felt a little disappointment that she was not at the depot to meet him while his chagrin increased at the tardiness of her appearance after his arrival home but she was coming at last and jimmy's quick ear caught the rustle of her garments as she came down the stairs and into the room smiling and blushing as she took his offered hand and begged him not to rise for her you are lame yet i see i had hoped your ankle might be well she said glancing at his cane which he carried more from habit and because it had been given him by an officer than from any real necessity his sprained ankle was almost well and only troubled him at times but after annie's look of commiseration at the cane and her evident intention to pity him for his ankle rather than his arm he found it vastly easy to be lame again and even made some excuse to cross the room in order to show off the limp which had not been very perceptible when he first came in and annie was very sorry for him and inquired with a great deal of interest into the particulars of his being wounded and kindly sat where he could look directly at her and thought alas how much he was changed from the fashionably dressed saucy-faced young man who went from them only a few months before short hair was not becoming to him neither was his thin burnt face neither was that soiled blue coat and he looked as little as possible like a hero whom maidens could worship 
some such thought passed through annie's mind while rose too felt the change in her handsome brother and with a puzzled expression on her face said to him as she stood by his side how queer you do look with your hair so short and the hollows in your cheeks does war change all the boys so much are tom and will such frights rose mrs carleton said reprovingly while annie looked up in surprise pitying jimmy whose chin quivered even more than his voice as he said tom and will have not been sick like me and then there's no denying it officers have easier times as a general thing than privates i do not mean by that that i regret my position for i do not somebody must take a private's place and it would better be i than a great many others but rose i shall regret it perhaps if by the means my looks become obnoxious to my sister and friends there was a marked emphasis on the word friends and jimmy's eyes went over appealingly to annie who remembered how proud the boy dick lee used to be of his beauty and guessed how rose's remarks must have wounded him rose suspected it too and winding her arms around his neck she tried to apologize forgive me jimmy she said i did not mean anything only your hair is so short just like the convicts at charlestown and your coat is so tumbled and dirty but hannah can wash that or i can buy you a new one and rose stumbled on making matters ten times worse until mrs carleton succeeded in turning the conversation upon something besides her son's personal appearance annie was very sorry for him and her sympathy expressed itself in the soft light of her blue eyes which rested so kindly upon him and in the low gentle cadence of her voice when she addressed him and her eager haste to bring him whatever she thought he wanted and so save him the pain of walking mrs carleton saw through that ruse at once she had noticed no limp when jimmy first came in and she readily suspected why it was put on but it was not for her to expose her son from a lady who had spent a few days at the mather house and who once lived near hartford mrs carleton had learned that the dr howard who had died of cholera in forty nine was highly respected both as a gentleman and a practising physician and this had helped to reconcile her in a great measure to whatever might result from her son's evident liking for annie graham nay annie howard and as she more than half suspected the heroine of jimmy's boyish fancy how very beautiful jimmy thought annie was after he had had time to recover himself a little and look at her closely she was in better health and certainly in better spirits than when he saw her last her cheeks were rounder her eyes were brighter and her hair more luxuriant and worn more in accordance with the prevailing style this was rose's doing as was also the increased length of annie's dress which swept the floor with so long a trail that the widow sims had made it the subject of sundry invidious remarks needn't tell her that a widder could wear such long switchin gowns and think just as much of the grave by the gate she knew better and miss graham was beginnin to get frilicky she could see through a millstone this was mrs sims's opinion of the long gored dress which jimmy noticed at once admiring the graceful symmetrical appearance it gave to annie's figure just as he admired the softening effect which the plain white collar and cuffs had upon annie's dress when he was home before everything about her was black of the deepest dye but now the sombreness of her attire was relieved somewhat and jimmy liked the change he could look at her without seeing constantly before him the grave by the churchyard gate where slept the man whose widow she was she did not seem like a widow she was so young only twenty-one as jimmy knew from rose who delighted with the friendly meeting between her brother and friend was again building castles of what might be could rose have had her choice in the matter she would have selected tom for annie he was older steadier while his letter seemed very much like annie tom had found the saviour of whom isaac sims once talked so earnestly in the prison house at richmond he was better than jimmy rose reasoned and more likely to suit annie still if it were to be otherwise she was satisfied and in a quiet way she aided and abetted jimmy in all his plans to be frequently alone with annie it was annie who rode with him when mrs carleton was indisposed and rose did not care to go annie who read to him the books which rose pronounced too stupid for anything annie who brought his cane and annie who finally attended to his wounded arm the physician did not come one day mrs carleton was sick and rose positively could not touch it and so annie timidly offered her services and jimmy knew from actual experience just how her soft fingers felt upon his arm 
his pulse throbbing and the blood tingling in every vein as she dressed his wound so carefully asking anxiously if she hurt him very badly he would have suffered martyrdom sooner than lose the opportunity of feeling those soft fingers upon his flesh and so it came about that annie was his surgeon and ministered daily to the wound which healed far too rapidly to suit the young man who began to shrink from a return to the life he had found so irksome tom had written twice for him to come as soon as possible and now only one day more remained of the month he was to spend at home the widow sims was ready to go with him susan had gone to her mother and the cottage was to be closed subject to a continual oversight from mrs baker and an occasional inspection from both rose and annie the box which isaac had hidden in the barn waiting for the bonfire which should celebrate our nation's final victory had been brought from its hiding-place and baptized with the first and only tears the widow had shed since she went back to her humble home and left him in the graveyard sacred to her was that box and she put it with her best table and chairs bidding annie graham see that no harm befell it and saying to her in case i never come back and peace is declared burn the box for isaac's sake right there on the grass plat which he dreamed about in richmond and annie promised all as she packed the widow's trunk putting in many little dainties which rose mather had supplied and which were destined for the soldiers whom the widow was to nurse she had been all day with mrs sims and rose had been back and forth with her packages curtailing her calls because of jimmy with whom she would spend as much time as possible jimmy was not in a very social mood that day the house was very lonely without annie and the young man did nothing but walk from one window to another looking always in the direction of widow sims and scarcely heeding at all what either his mother or sister were saying to him when it began to grow dark and he heard rose speak of sending the carriage for annie as she had promised to do he said i ought to see mrs sims myself to-night and know if everything is in readiness for to-morrow i will go for mrs graham and rose don't order the carriage there is a fine moon and she that is i would rather walk oh jimmy she exclaimed i'm so glad tell her so for me i thought at first you did not like each other and everything was going wrong i am so glad though i had picked her out for tom i most know he fancied her and then he is a widower it would be more suitable rose meant nothing disparaging to jimmy's suit she did think tom with his thirty-two years better suited to annie who had been a wife than saucy-faced teasing jimmy of only twenty-four but love never consults the suitability of a thing and jimmy was desperately in love by this time it was not possible for one of his temperament to live a whole month with annie as he had lived and not be in love with her her graceful beauty brightened by the auxiliaries of dress and improved health and the thousand little attentions she paid him just because he was a soldier had finished the work begun when he was home before and he could not go back without hearing from her own lips whether there was any hope for him the scamp the scapegrace the rebel as he had been called by turns what rose said of tom brought a shadow to his face and as he walked rapidly toward widow sims not limping now or scarcely touching his cane to the ground he thought of tom old tom he called him wondering how much he had been interested in annie graham and asking himself if it were just the thing for him to take advantage of tom's absence and supplant him in the affections of one whom he might perhaps have won had he an opportunity but tom has had his day jimmy thought he can't expect another wife as nice as mary was and it is only fair for me to try my luck i never loved any one before jimmy stopped suddenly here stopped in his soliloquy and his walk and looking up into the starry sky thought of the boy at new london and the hills beyond and the hotel on the beach and the white-robed little figure with blue ribbons in the golden hair and the soft light in the violet eyes which used to watch for his coming and looked so bright and yet so modest withal when he came louise her aunt had called her and he had designated her as lou or lulu just as the fancy took him i did love her some jimmy thought yes i loved her as well as a boy of seventeen is capable of loving as i deceived her shabbily i wonder where she is she must be twenty or more by this time and a woman much like annie if i could find her who knows that i might not like her best and for a moment jimmy revolved the propriety of leaving annie to tom while he sought for his first love of the pequot house 
but annie graham had made too strong an impression upon him to be given up for a former love who might be dead for aught he knew and so tom was cast overboard and jimmy resumed his walk in the direction of widow sim's cottage the widow's trunks were all packed and ready everything was done in the cottage which annie could do and with a tired flush on her cheek a tumbled look about her hair and a rent in the black dress made by a nail on one of the boxes annie was waiting for the carriage and half wishing as she looked out into the bright moonlight that she was going to walk home instead of riding the fresh air would do her good she thought just as jimmy appeared at the door he had come to see if there was anything he could do for mrs sims he said and to escort mrs graham home annie's cheeks were very red as she went for her shawl and then bade good-bye to mrs sims whom she did not expect to see on the morrow as soon as they were outside the gate jimmy drew her shawl close round her neck and taking her arm in his said to her the night is very fine and warm too for the first of november you won't mind taking the longest route home i am sure as it is the last time i may ever walk with you and there is something i must tell you before i go back to danger and possible death he had turned into a long grassy lane or newly opened street where there were but few houses yet and annie knew the route would at least be a mile out of the way but she could not resist the man who held her so closely to his side she must hear what he had to say and with an upward glance at the clear blue sky where she fancied george was looking down upon her she nerved herself to listen annie he began i've called you mrs graham heretofore but for to-night you must be annie even if you give me no right to call you by that name again annie i have been a scamp a wretch a rebel and almost everything bad i deceived a young girl in new london years ago when i was a boy rose told you something about it once her name was louise lulu i called her and i made her think i loved her and didn't you love her annie asked suddenly her voice ringing clear in the still night and making jimmy start there was something so quiet and determined in its tone still he had no suspicion that the woman beside him was the girl he had left on the beach at new london and he continued yes annie i did as boys of seventeen love girls of fourteen she was pretty and soft and pure and good and i kissed her once on her forehead and then i went away and never saw her after or knew what became of her and i am telling you this by way of confessing my misdeeds for i've been a fast and reckless young man i've gambled and sneered at the bible and broken the sabbath heaps of times and flirted with more than forty girls some of them not very respectable either and none as pure as little lulu i ran away from home and nearly broke my mother's heart i joined the rebel army and fought against my brother at the battle of bull run i was captured by bill baker and led with a halter to washington and there shut up in prison a fine character i give myself and yet after all this i have dared to love you annie graham and i have brought you this way to ask if you will be my wife not now of course not before i go back but if i come through the war alive will you be mine then annie tell me darling and don't tremble so or turn your face away annie was shaking in every joint and the face which jimmy tried in vain to see was white as ashes she had expected something like this when he led her down that grassy lane but nevertheless it came to her with a shock making her feel as if in some way she had injured her dead husband by listening to another's love and still she could not at once repulse the young man whose arm was around her and who had drawn her to a gap in a stone wall where he made her sit down while she answered him strange feelings had swept over her as she heard jimmy carleton's voice telling her how much she was beloved how from the first moment he saw her he had been interested in her and asking her again if she had anything to give the recreant jim he said the last playfully but there was a great fear at his heart lest her silence portended evil to him no mr carleton i have no heart to give you i buried it with george i can never love another forgive me if in any way i have misled you i was only kind to you as i would be to any soldier bill baker for instance came savagely from jimmy's lips he was cruelly disappointed for he had not believed annie would refuse him as she had done he thought a good deal of himself as a carleton nay he believed himself superior to the man who was standing between him and the woman he coveted and to be so decidedly refused by one who had been content with a person in george graham's position angered him for a moment 
Annie knew he was offended, and when he spoke of Bill Baker, she said to him gently, "'You mistake me, Mr. Carlton. If necessary, I could do for William Baker more than I have done for you, but it would only be from a sense of duty. There would be no pleasure in it, while caring for you was a pleasure, because you are Mrs. Mather's brother, and because... because... She did not know how to finish the sentence, for she could not herself tell why it had of late been so pleasant for her to do for Jimmy Carlton those little acts of kindness which had devolved on her. She was only interested in him as a soldier, she insisted, and she tried to make him understand that her decision was final, that were George dead a dozen years, she should give him the same answer as she did now. She could not be his wife and jimmy understood it at last and by the terrible pangs of disappointment which crept over him the pequot girl was fully avenged for the many times she had watched from her window of the hotel or walked sadly along the road by the bay to see if dick lee were coming but annie had no wish for revenge she was only sorry for him and she tried to comfort him with the assurance of her interest in him and by telling him that if ever he was sick in hospital or camp and unable to come home she would surely go to him as readily as if he were her brother jimmy did not particularly care for such comforting then and his face when he reached home wore so dark and sorry a look that rose knew at once that something was wrong but she refrained from asking any questions then feeling intuitively that both Annie and her brother would prefer to have her do so. It was a very grave, silent party which met at the breakfast-table next morning, and only Annie was at all inclined to talk. She tried to be cheerful and appear as usual to the silent young man who never looked at her as she sat opposite him, with her smooth bands of hair so becomingly arranged and her eyes so full of pity for him. She could not revoke her decision but she was sorry to send him from her with that look upon his face and when after breakfast she met him for a few moments alone in the library she laid her hand timidly upon his arm and said jimmy don't be angry with me try to think of me as your sister your best friend if you like it grieves me that i have made you so unhappy she had never called him jimmy before in his hearing and as she did it now the dark handsome face into which she was looking flushed with a sudden joy as if he thought she were relenting but she was not she could only be his friend his best friend she repeated and her face was very pale as she told him how she should remember him and work for him and pray for him when he was gone and then she gave him her hand saying to him it is nearly time for you to go I would rather say good-bye here. And Jimmy took her hand, and pressing it between his own, said to her, You have hurt me cruelly, Annie Graham, for I believed you cared for me. But I cannot hate you for it, though I tried to do so all night long. I love you just the same as ever, and always shall. Remember your promise to come to me when I am sick, and let me kiss you once for the sake of what I hoped might be. She did not refuse his request and when at last he left her there was a red spot on her cheek where jimmy carleton's lips had been from her window she watched him going down the walk and while with widow sims he waited at the depot for the coming of the train she on her knees was praying for him and his safety just as eighteen months before she prayed for george when he was going from her twenty three tom and jimmy jimmy's journey was performed in safety and he won golden opinions from his travelling companion for whom he had cared as kindly as if it had been his mother instead of the crabbed widow in her eternal leghorn with the veil of faded green he had left her at one of the hospitals in washington where she was to begin her work as nurse and hastened on to join his regiment captain carleton was glad to welcome back the brother whom he had missed so much but he saw that something was wrong and that night as they sat around the tent-fire he asked what it was and why the face usually so bright and cheerful seemed so sober and sad tom had made minute inquiries concerning his mother and rose and susan sims and even poor old mrs baker but not a word of annie he could not speak of her with that unfinished letter lying in his little travelling writing-case that letter commencing my dear mrs graham and over the wording of which tom had spent more time by far than he did ever the first epistle sent to mary williams that had been dashed off in all the heat of a young man's first ardent passion just as jimmy two weeks ago would have written to annie but tom was eight years older than jimmy 
his first love had met its full fruition and mary the object was dead tom had always been old for his years he looked and seemed and felt full forty now save when he thought of annie who was only twenty-one then he went back to thirty-two glad that he had numbered no more birthdays he had made up his mind to write to her a friendly letter the first should be he said a letter merely asking if she would correspond with him and hinting at the interest he had felt in her ever since he saw how much she was to rose and how constant were her labours for the suffering soldiers if her answer was favourable he should ere long ask her to be his wife and this is the way he took to win the woman whose name he would not mention to his brother he had been a little uneasy when jimmy first went home for he knew how popular the wayward youth was with all the ladies but as rose had never written a word to strengthen him in his fears he had thrown them aside and commenced the letter which to-night after jimmy was gone he was intending to finish for the morrow's mail he changed his mind however as the night wore on for in reply to his question as to what was the matter jimmy had burst out impetuously with it's all over with me and the widow i went in strong for her tom i told her all my badness confessed everything i could and then she said it could not be i tell you tom i did not know a man could be so sore about a woman and with a great choking sob jimmy carleton laid his head upon tom's lap and moaned like some wounded animal tom who had been as a father to this younger brother was touched to his heart's core and felt as if by having that unfinished letter in his possession he was in some way guilty and as a pitying woman would have done he smoothed the dark curly hair and tried to speak words of comfort what had annie said perhaps she might relent would jimmy tell him about it then jimmy lifted up his head and looking straight in tom's eyes said forgive me old tom i was inclined to be jealous of you rose said you were more suitable and i know you are but tom i did love annie so much after i had swallowed the first husband which cost me a great effort for a widow is not the beau ideal i used to cherish of my future wife tom you don't care for annie do you he continued in a startled tone as something in tom's face affrighted him tom would not deceive him then and he replied i have that is yes i do care for her and i had commenced a letter but don't finish it tom do this for me don't finish it jimmy exclaimed eagerly knowing now how the hope that annie might relent had buoyed him up and kept him from utter despondency don't send it tom leave her to me if i can win her yet she may feel differently by and by her husband is only one year dead let me have annie tom and jimmy grew more vehement as he saw plainly the struggle in tom's mind you've had your day with mary think of your years of married life when you were so happy and leave annie to me at least don't try to get her from me not yet wait a year will you tom few could resist jimmy carleton's pleadings when they were so earnest as now and generous tom yielded to the boy whom he had scolded and whipped and disciplined and loved and grieved over ever since the day their father died and left him the head of the family i will wait a year and see what that brings to us and you jimmy must do the same then annie shall decide he said at last and his voice was so steady in its tone and his manner so kind that jimmy never guessed how much it cost the man who had had his day to unlock the little desk and take from it the letter intended for annie graham and commit it to the flames they watched it together as it crisped and blackened on the coals neither saying a word or stirring until the last thin flake had disappeared when tom bent to pick up something which had dropped from the desk when he took out the letter it was mary's picture and in her lap the baby which had died when six months old yes i have had my day tom thought as he gazed upon the fair sweet face of her whose bright head had once lain where he had thought to have annie's lie i have had my day and though it closed before it was noon i will not interfere with jimmy and so the compact was sealed between them and jimmy slept sounder on his soldier bed that night than he had slept before since annie's refusal jimmy was not selfish and as the days went by and he reflected more and more upon tom's generosity his conscience smote him for having allowed his brother to sacrifice his happiness for a whim of his she might have refused him too and then again she might not at all events he had a right to try his luck jimmy reasoned until at last his sense of justice triumphed and he wrote to annie an account of the whole transaction it was mean in me to let tom burn the letter he said 
but i could not bear the thought of his winning what i had lost and so like a coward i looked on and felt a thrill of satisfaction when i saw his letter crisping on the coals but as proof that i have repented of that selfish act i ask you plainly would you have replied favourably to that letter had it been sent if so tell me truly and without ever betraying the fact that i have written to you on the subject i will manage to have tom write again and if the fate shall so decree i will try to forget that gap in the stone wall where we sat that night when i told you of my love his letter found annie sick in bed from the effects of a severe cold which kept her so long in her room that it was not till just on the eve of the battle of fredericksburg that jimmy received her answer i should say no to your brother just as i did to you this was what jimmy read and with a feeling of relief as far as tom was concerned he crushed the few lines into his pocket and went on with his preparations for the contest at fredericksburg which seemed inevitable with a kind of recklessness which characterized many of our soldiers jimmy had heretofore felt no fears of a battle the bullet which might strike down another would not harm him and he charged his preservation mostly to annie's prayers for his safety but in this her last brief note she had not said so much as god bless you and jimmy's heart beat faster as he thought of the impending danger jimmy seldom prayed but if annie had failed him he must try what he could do for himself and when the night came down upon that vast army camping in the woods and on the hillside it looked on one young face upturned to the wintry sky and the moaning winds carried up to heaven the few words of prayer which jimmy carleton said oppressed with a strange feeling of foreboding he prayed earnestly that god would blot out all his manifold transgressions and if he died grant him an entrance into heaven where annie was sure to go close beside him crouched bill who listened with wonder to the corporal a feeling of terror beginning to creep into his own heart as he detected the accents of fear in his companion i say corporal he began when jimmy's devotions were ended be you afraid of something's happenin to you when they set us to crossin that darned river and if there does shall i write to the folks and the gal you mentioned and tell em you prayed like a parson the night before jimmy was terribly annoyed with bill's impertinence and for a man who had just been praying did not exercise as much christian forbearance as might have been expected a harsh mind your own business was his only reply which bill received with a good-humoured guess you'll have to try again corporal before you get into the right frame and then there was silence between them and the night crept on apace and the early morning began to break and the wintry sky was obscured by a thick dull haze which hid for a time our soldiers from view then a deadly fire of musketry from the opposite bank of the rappahannock was opened upon them till they fled to the shelter of the adjacent hills where forming into line they again went back to the laying of the pontoon bridges while the roar of the cannon shook the hills and told the listeners miles away that the battle of fredericksburg was begun end of chapters twenty two and twenty three chapters twenty four through twenty six of rose mather a tale by mary jane holmes this librivox recording is in the public domain twenty four results of the battle the streets of rockland were full of excited people when the news first reached the town of the terrible battle which had left so many slain upon the field and desolated so many hearths both north and south rose mather was nearly frantic for will she knew was in the battle together with her two brothers and it was not probable that all three would escape unharmed eagerly she grasped the paper to see who was killed wounded or missing but neither of the three names was there and she began to hope again and found time to comfort poor susan sims whose husband was also in the fight and who had gone almost mad with the fear lest he should be killed two days passed and then there came a telegram from tom and mrs carleton who read it first gave a low moaning cry while rose who read it next uttered a piercing shriek and fell sobbing into annie's arms oh will oh will my husband was what she said while mrs carleton uttered jimmy's name and then annie knew that harm had come to him and placing rose upon the sofa she took the paper from mrs carleton's hand and read will was badly wounded lay on the field all night jimmy missing supposed to be a prisoner i am well t carleton poor jimmy annie whispered sadly her heart throbbing with pity for the young man who had gone back in time to meet so sad a fate never had so dark a day dawned upon rose mather as that which followed the arrival of tom's telegram 
but ere its close there came a message of hope to her will had been taken to washington where he had providentially fallen into the hands of mrs sims who sent the joyful news that no bones were broken and he was doing well oh annie god is so much better to me than i deserve i must love him now and i will if he will only send jimmy back rose said while annie's heart went up in a prayer of thanksgiving for mr mather's comparative safety and then went out after the poor prisoner whose destination was as yet unknown that night rose started for washington and three days after there came to annie a soiled queer-looking missive directed to miss widder annie graham at miss martha's the name written at the top of the letter and the superscription spreading over so much surface that had there been another word it must from necessity have been written on the other side of the letter it was from bill baker and it read as follows army of potomac and about as licked out an army as you ever seen to all it may concern and especially miss annie graham i send you my regrets greetin and hopin this will find you enjoyin the same great blessin burnside has made the thunderinest blunder and more'n a million of our boys is dead before fredericksburg mr mathers was about riddled through i guess and the corporal well may as well take it easy i fit for him like a tiger till they knocked me endways and i played dead to save my life but the corporal's a goner took prisoner with an awful cut on his neck and now what i'm going to tell you is this the night before the battle i came upon him prayin like a priest kneelin in an awful mud puddle and what he said was something about heaven and annie which beggin your pardon i think means you and so i asked him in case of bad luck if i should write and tell you i don't think he could have been in a very spiritual frame of mind for he told me to mind my business but i don't lay it up agin him and when them two tall lantern-jawed sons of balaam grabbed him as he was trying to skedaddle with the blood a-spurtin from his neck i pitched into em and gave em hail columby for a spell till they knocked me flat and i made bleave dead as i was tellin you don't feel bad miss graham trust luck and keep your powder dry and mabby he'll come back some time yours to command bill baker tell the old woman i'm well but pretty well tuckered out god soften the hearts of his captors god keep him in safety annie whispered and then as mrs carleton came in she passed the note to her and tried to comfort the poor mother who in rose's absence leaned on her as on a daughter annie seemed very near the sorrowing woman who wept bitterly for her poor boy and in the first hours of her sorrow she spoke out what was in her mind i believe jimmy loved you annie and that makes you very dear to me we can mourn for him together and annie you will pray for him night and day that god will bring him back to us annie could only reply by pressing the hand which sought hers for her heart was too full to speak had jimmy been dead she would scarcely have mourned for him more deeply than she did now the country was already rife with rumours of the sufferings endured by our prisoners and death itself seemed almost preferable to months and years of privations and pain in the southern prisons sent to richmond and probably from thence further south probably to georgia this was all the intelligence they could procure from him until spring when there came news direct that he was at salisbury and there for a time the curtain dropped leaving his face shrouded in darkness while in his northern home tears were shed like rain and prayers went up to heaven from the quivering lips of a mother who was just learning to pray as she ought and in annie graham's heart there gradually crept a wish that the poor weary prisoner might know how much and how kindly she thought of him feeling at times half sorry that she had not given him some little hope as a solace for the weary hours of his prison life twenty five gettysburg rose mather had brought her husband home as soon as it was safe to move him and with the good nursing of mrs carleton and annie he grew strong enough to rejoin his regiment in may and the last which rose heard from him directly was a few words hastily written and sent off to washington just as the army of the potomac was moving on to gettysburg then came the terrible battle when the summer air was full of smoke and dust and flying splinters with clouds of torn-up earth which blinded the horror-stricken men who vainly sought for shelter behind the trees and the headstones of the graveyard where the dead must almost have heard the fierce commotion around them as wail after wail of human anguish mingled with the awful shrieks of dying horses went up to the blackened heavens and then died away in silence where the battle was the hottest and the carnage the most terrible will mather followed or rather led 
and when the fight had ceased he lay upon his face unconscious of the pitiless rain beating upon his head or the two savage-looking texans bending over him and turning him to the light among the list of killed the rockland chronicle of july tenth had the name of william mather while in another column designated by long lines of black was a eulogy upon the deceased who was known to have fought so bravely then every blind of the mather mansion was closed and knots of crape streamed from the door-knob and the villagers missed the roll of the carriage wheels which were wont to carry so much comfort and sunshine to the hearts of the poor soldiers and the little airy dancing creature whose bright smile and rare beauty had done quite as good service as her generous gifts lay in her darkened room never weeping never speaking except to moan so piteously oh will my darling my poor poor husband they could not comfort her for she did not seem to hear or at least to understand one word they said and the soft dark eyes had in them a wild scared look which troubled the watchers at her side and made them tremble for her safety the knots of crape were taken from the doors and the blinds were opened at last and the light of heaven let into the dreary house but there came no change to poor little rose whose white face grew so thin that tom when in september he came home to see her would scarcely have known the little sister of whose beauty he had been so proud as if the sight of him in his uniform had brought back the horror of the past she uttered a piercing shriek and hid her face for a moment in her pillows then with a sudden movement lifted her head and shedding back her tangled curls from her pale forehead she stretched her arms toward him and whispered take me tom hold me as you used to do let me be a little girl again in the old home in boston for will you know is dead and tom took her in his strong brotherly arms and laid her head against his breast and caressed and smoothed her tumbled hair and petted and loved her just as he did when she was a little child with no shadow around her like that which enfolded her now and then he spoke of will and the dark eyes fastened eagerly upon him as he told her how the very night before the battle will knelt down with him and prayed that whether he lived or died all might be well with him and rose he continued he bade me tell you in case he was killed that all was well and you must think of him as in heaven not far as some suppose but near to you with you he said and you must meet him there you must bear bravely what god chooses to send not give up like this when there is so much to be done will my darling little sister heed what poor will said will she try to rally and be a brave woman yes tom i'll try came gaspingly from the white lips and rose's voice was broken with sobs as the first tear she had shed since she heard the fatal news ran in torrents down her face tom only stayed a week but he did them a world of good and annie felt she had never known one half how noble a man he was until she saw how tender he was with rose and how kind to his mother whose heart was aching to its very core for her youngest son he had been removed from salisbury to andersonville when they last heard from him and was dead perhaps by this time poor jimmy the year he had asked tom to wait would be up before very long but tom would still keep faith with him annie was sacred to jimmy's memory and once when talking with her of the captive he alluded to what would probably be when jimmy came home again and annie did not turn from him now as she would once have done had such a thing been suggested god only knows how i might feel she said and by the look in her blue eyes and the tone of her voice tom knew there was no hope for him with many kisses and loving words of sympathy he bade his sister good-bye when his leave had expired and then in the hall stood a moment while his mother whispered something to him which made him start and turn pale as he said poor will he would have been so glad then as if the news had brought rose nearer to him and made her more the object of his special care he went back to her a second time and wound his arms about her lovingly as he said poor little wounded dove god's promises are for the widow and fatherless and he will care for you and rose guessed to what he referred but there was no answering joy upon her face and her hands were pressed upon her heart as she watched him from the window going from her just as will had gone and whispered to herself it would have been too much happiness if will had lived but now i cannot be glad twenty six course of events 
with a howl of despair mrs baker came rushing into the kitchen of the mather mansion one morning in november startling annie with her vehemence as she thrust into her hand a dirty half-worn envelope which she said was from bill who had been missing since august and who it now appeared was at andersonville might better be dead his mother said and then she explained that the letter she brought annie had come in one to herself received that morning from bill how he ever got it through the lines was a mystery which he did not explain nor did annie care inasmuch as it brought news direct from jimmy he had written to her with the pencil on the sheet of paper bill had brought him for bill baker was employed outside the prison walls and allowed many privileges which were denied to the poor wretches who crowded that swampy pen in short bill had taken the confederate oath had done some tall swearin as he wrote to annie giving as an excuse for the treasonable act that he couldn't stand the racket in that horrible place where twenty thousand human beings were crowded together in a space of twenty-five acres and part of that a marshy swamp teeming with filth and scum and hideous living things another reason too bill gave and that was pity for the corporal to whom he could occasionally take little extras and whom he would have scarcely recognized he said so worn and changed had he become from his long imprisonment i mistrusted he was there bill wrote and so when me and some other fellow travellers was safely landed in purgatory i went on an explorin tower to find him but you bet it wa'n't so easy gettin through that crowd why the camp meetin they had in the fair grounds in rockland when marm freeman buster biller hollerin was nothin to the piles of ragged dirty hungry lookin dogs some standin up some lyin down and all lookin as if they was on their last legs right on a little sand-bank and so near the dead line that i wonder he didn't get shot i found the corporal with his trousers tore to tatters and lookin like the old gal's rag-bag that hangs in the cellar way didn't he cry though when i hit him a kelp on the back and want there some tall cryin done by both of us as we sat there flat on the sand with the hot sun pourin down on us and the sweat and the tears runnin down his face as he told me all he'd suffered it made my blood bile i've had a little taste of libby and belle isle too but they can't hold a candle to this place miss graham you are the good sort kind of pious like but i'll be hanged if i don't believe you'll justify me in the thumpin lies i told the corporal that day to keep his spirits up says he have you ever been to rockland since fredericksburg and then i thought in a minute of that night in the woods when he prayed about annie and says i to myself the piousest lie you ever told will be that you have been home and seen miss graham with any other triflin additions you may think best so i told him i had been home on a fur below as the old gal meanin my mother calls it and i seen her too says i miss graham and she talked an awful sight about you i said when you ought to have seen him shiver all over as he got up closer to me and asked what did she say then i went on romancin and told him how you spent a whole evenin at the old hut talkin about him and how sorry you was for him and couldn't get your natural sleep for thinking of him and how when i came away you said to me on the sly william if you ever happen to meet mr carleton give him annie graham's love and tell him she means it great peter i could almost see the flesh come back to his bones and his eyes had the old look in em as he liked to have hugged me to death i'd done him a world of good he said and for some days he seemed as chipper as you please but nobody can stand a diet of raw meal in the nastiest water that ever run and says i to myself corporal will die as sure as thunder if something don't turn up and so when i got the hang of things a little and seen how the machine was worked says i i'll turn secesh though i hate em as i do pizen they was glad enough to have me bein i'm a kind of carpenter and jiner and they let me out and i went to work for the corporal i'll bet i told a hundred lies fast and last if i did one i said he was at heart secesh that he was in the rebel army and i took him prisoner at manassas which you know was true then i said his sweetheart meanin you beggin your pardon got up a row and made him jine the federals and promised never to go again the flag and that's how he come to be nabbed up at fredericksburg 
I said twa'n't no use to try to make him swear, for he thought more of his gal's good opinion than he did of liberty, and I set you up till I swan if I believe you'd a known to yourself, and every one of them fellers was ready to stand by you, and two of em drinked your health with the wust whiskey I ever tasted. One of em asked me if I was a fair specimen of the Northern Army, and I'll be darned if I didn't tell him no, for I was ashamed to have em think the Federals was all like me. I guess though they liked me some. Anyway, they let me carry something to the corporal every now and then, and I believe he'd die if I didn't. I've smuggled him in some paper and a pencil, and he is going to write to you, and I shall send it no matter how. The Rebs won't see it, and I guess it's pretty sure to go safe. I must stop now and write to the old woman. Yours to command. William Baker Esquire. It was with great difficulty that Annie could decipher the badly written scrawl but she made it out at last and then took jimmy's letter next shuddering as she saw it in marks of the horrors which bill had described but faintly and which were fully corroborated by jimmy himself my dear annie he wrote i do not know that this letter will ever reach you i have but little hope that it will still it is worth trying for and so here in this terrible place whose horrors no pen or tongue can adequately describe i am writing to you who I know thinks sometimes of the poor wretch starving and dying by inches in Andersonville. Oh, Annie, you can never know what I have suffered from hunger and thirst and exposure and filth which makes my very blood curdle and creep, and from that weary homesickness which more than aught else kills the poor boys around me. When I first came here I thought I could not endure it, and though I knew I was not prepared I used to wish that I might die but a little drummer boy from michigan who took to me from the first said his prayers one night beside me and the listening to him carried me back to you who i felt sure prayed for me each day and so hope came back again with a desire to live and see your dear face once more my little drummer boy johnny was all the world to me and when he grew too sick to sit or stand i held his poor head in my lap and gave up my rations to him for he was almost famished and ate eagerly whatever was brought to us we used to say the lord's prayer together every night when a certain star appeared which he playfully called his mother saying it was her eye watching over him it was a childish fancy but we grow childish here and i too have given that star a name i call it annie and i watch its coming as eagerly as did the little boy who died just as the star reached the zenith and was shining down upon him his head was in my lap and all there was left of my coat i made into a pillow for him and held him till he died his mother's address is blank michigan write to her annie and tell her how johnny died in the firm hope of meeting her again in heaven tell her he did not suffer much pain only a weakness which wasted his life away tell her the keepers were kind to him and brought him ice water several times tell her too of the star at which he gazed so long as he had strength it was all the companion i had after he was gone until bill baker came i shall never forget that day i had crawled up to my sandbank and drawn my rags around me and was beginning to wish again that i could die when a broad hand was laid upon my shoulder and a voice which was music to me then if it had never been before said to me cheerily hello old corporal such are the chances of war give us your fist but when he saw what a sorry jaded wretch i was his chin began to quiver and we cried together like two great babies as we were oh annie was it a lie bill baker told me or did you really send me your love and say that you meant it he told me such a story and i grew better in a moment have you relented and if i could ask you again the question i asked a year ago when we sat together beneath the moonlight would you tell me yes darling annie andersonville is not so terrible since i am kept up by that hope i do not mind now if my shoes and stockings are all gone and my trousers nearly so and i watch for that star so eagerly and make believe that it is you and when the dark clouds obscure it and the rain is falling upon my unsheltered head i say that it is annie's tears and do not mind that either i pray too annie pray with my heart i hope though my prayers have more to do with you than myself bill baker said he should write and tell you about his taking the oath which i believe he did almost solely for my sake and greatly have i been benefited by it 
rough as he is and disgusting at times he seems to have gained friends outside and he does us many a kindness confining his attentions mostly to me who am his especial care it is a strange providence that he who took me a prisoner at bull run and annoyed me so terribly should now be caring for me here at andersonville and literally keeping the life within me for i should die without him i have not written half i want to say but my paper is nearly used up and not one word have i said to mother or rose tell them they would not know me now and tell them too that in my dreams when i am not with you i am with them and mother's face is like an angel's while rose's sparkling beauty makes my heart beat just as it used to beat when i first began to realize what a darling sister i had dear annie you did send that message by bill baker i will believe and thus believing shall gain strength maybe to bear up until the day of release good-bye my darling from my crowded filthy terrible prison i send you a loving good-bye notwithstanding the sickening details of this letter the day succeeding its receipt was a brighter one at the mather house than the inmates had known for a long time jimmy was still alive and with bill baker's care he might survive the horrors of andersonville and come back to them again annie showed both letters to mrs carleton who when she read them wound her arms around annie's neck and whispered is it wrong for me to be glad that bill baker told that lie when by the means our prisoner boy is so greatly benefited annie could not tell she was not sorry that jimmy should think of her as he did and that night when the stars came out in the sky she looked tearfully up at them wondering which was the one watched for by the childish young man and the little boy who died mrs carleton had taken it for granted that if jimmy came back annie would be her daughter and she clung to her with a love and tenderness second only to what she felt for rose poor rose she had listened with some degree of interest to such portions of jimmy's letter as annie chose to read to her but it had no power to rouse her from the state of apathy into which she had fallen she never smiled now and rarely spoke except to answer a question but sat all day by the window in her own room and looked away to the southward where all her thoughts were centred it was very strange that nothing could be heard of her husband except that he was shot down dead a dozen corroborated that fact but his body had not been found on the field nor was any mention ever made of him in any official accounts once rose had been startled from her stupor by a soldier who pretended to have seen her husband in one of the southern prisons but a closer examination proved that the man was intoxicated and had told what he did in the hope that money might be given him for the intelligence and then rose sank back into her former condition the same hopeless look in her eyes which had been there from the moment she heard her husband's name among the killed and the same look of anguish upon her face which never relaxed a muscle as she watched indifferently the preparations made by her mother and annie for an event which under other circumstances would have stirred every pulsation of her heart but when on christmas morning the bell from st luke's was sending forth its joyous peal for the child born in bethlehem more than eighteen hundred years ago there came a softer more natural look to rose's eyes and her lip quivered a little as she said to annie who was bending over her what is that sound in the next room like the crying of a baby it is your baby rose born last night don't you remember it a beautiful little boy with his father's look in his eyes and jimmy's dimple in his chin annie hoped by mentioning both the father and jimmy to awaken some interest in the little mother whose eyes grew larger and rounder and brighter as she whispered my baby i can't understand it is all so strange and mysterious how came i with a baby annie bring it to me please they brought it to her and laid it in her arms and then stood watching her as the first tokens of the mother's love came over her face and crept into her eyes which gradually began to fill with tears until at last a storm of sobs and moans burst forth as rose rocked to and fro whispering to her child poor darling to be born without a father when he would have been so proud of his boy poor murdered will poor fatherless baby i am glad god gave you to me i did not deserve it i have been so thoughtless and wicked but i will be better now dear little baby we will grow good together so as to go some day where papa has gone she would not let them take the child from her it was hers she said god had sent it to make her better and she would have it there was something in the touch of its soft warm hands which kept her heart from breaking 
and so they left it with her and from the day that little life came to be one in the household rose began to amend and in her love for her child forgot in part the terrible pain in her heart once her mother said to her will you call your baby william and she replied no there is but one willie for me and he is in heaven baby will be called for brother jimmy and so one bright sunday morning in march when st luke's was decked with flowers from the mather hothouse and the children of the sunday school sang their easter carols rose mather in her widow's weeds went up the aisle with her mother annie and brother tom the latter of whom gave her bright-eyed beautiful boy to the rector who baptized him james carleton and all through the congregation there ran a thrill of pity for the widowed mother whose face though it had lost some of its brilliant colour was more beautiful than ever for there was shining all over it the light of a new joy the peace which comes from sins forgiven and after the baptism was over and the morning service read rose knelt with her mother brother and annie to receive for the first time the precious symbols of a saviour's dying love rose had ceased to oppose annie in her wish to join mrs sims who was then at annapolis and when tom a few days after the baptism went back again annie would go with him as a regular hospital nurse it might be that jimmy would be among the number of skeletons sent up to god's land as the poor fellows called it and annie's heart throbbed with the pleasure it would be to minister to him to call the life back to his heart to awaken an interest in him for olden times and then perhaps whisper to him that the decision made that moonlight night more than a year and a half ago had been revoked and where she had said no her answer now was yes between herself and mrs carleton there had been a long talk of which jimmy and the little pequot girl were the subjects and the proud lady had asked forgiveness for the wrong done to that girl if wrong there were something tells me you will find my boy she said and if you do tell him how freely i give him this little lulu and god bless you both a few weeks later and news came to the mather house that when the battle of the wilderness was over captain tom carleton was not with his handful of men who came from the field a prisoner of war was the next report and then as if her last hope had been taken from her mrs carleton broke down entirely and secluding herself from the world without sat down in her desolation mourning and praying for her two boys one a prisoner in Andersonville, and one in Columbia. End of chapters 24 through 26。Chapters 27 and 28 of Rose Mather, a tale by Mary Jane Holmes。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。27. The Hunted Soldier the sun was just rising and his red beams gilded the summits of the allegheny mountains which in the glory of the early morning seemed as calm and peaceful as if their lofty heights had never looked down upon scenes of carnage and strife or their tangled passes and dark ravines sheltered poor starving frightened wretches fleeing for their lives and braving death in any form rather than be recaptured by their merciless pursuers there were several of these miserable men hiding in the mountain passes now prisoners escaped from salisbury and other points but our story now has to do with but one and that a young man with a look of determination in his eye and the courage of a samson in his heart he had suffered incredible hardship since the day of his capture he had been stripped at once of his handsome uniform by the brutal texans who found him upon the field his gold which he carried about his person into every battle had been taken from him and in this condition he had been sent from one prison to another until salisbury received him at first he had suffered but little mentally for the ball which struck him down had left him with his reason impaired and to him it was all the same whether friend or foe had him in keeping deprived of everything which could mark his rank as an officer and always insisting that his name was rose he passed for a demented creature whom the brutal soldiery delighted to torment gradually however his reason came back and he woke to the full horrors of his condition then like a caged lion he chafed and fumed and resolved to be free he could not die there knowing that far away there was a blithesome little woman waiting for his coming if indeed she had not ceased to think of him as among the living a state of things which he thought very probable as he became aware of the fact that no one of his companions was acquainted with his real name rose was the only cognomen by which he was known and the proud man shivered every time he heard that dear name uttered by the coarse jesting lips around him 
a horrid suit of dirty grey had been given him in place of the stolen uniform and though at first he rebelled against the filthy garments he began ere long to think how they might aid him in his escape inasmuch as they were the garb of the confederates day and night he studied the best means of escape until at last the attempt was made and he stood one dark rainy night out on the highway a free man breathing the pure breath of heaven and ready to sell his life at any cost rather than go back again to the prison he had left he had put his trust in god and god had raised him up a friend at once who had seen him leave the prison and greatly aided him in his escape just as he had aided others knowing the while that by doing so he was putting his own life in jeopardy but a staunch unionist at heart he was willing to brave everything for the cause and it was through his instrumentality and minute directions that will mather had finally reached the shelter of the mountains which separate north carolina from tennessee he had found friends all along the route true loyal men who had perilled their lives for him brave tender women whose hands had ministered so kindly to his wants and who had so cheerfully divided with him their scanty meals even though hunger was written upon their thin haggard faces and stared in their sunken eyes and will had taken down each name and registered a vow that if ever he reached the north these noble self-denying people should be rewarded and if possible removed from a neighbourhood where they suffered so much from privation and from the hands of their former friends who suspecting their sentiments heaped upon them every possible abuse ragged bareheaded footsore and worn he came at last at the close of a june day to the entrance of a cave in the hills to which he had been directed and where on the damp earth he slept so soundly from fatigue and exhaustion that the morning sun was shining through the entrance to the cave and a robin on a shrub growing near was trilling its morning song ere he awoke the air though damp from the water which trickled through the rocks was close and stifling and will crept cautiously out from his hiding-place and sitting down upon the ground drank in the beauty and stillness of the summer morning exactly where he was he did not know but he felt certain that his face was toward the land where the stars and stripes were waving and a thrill of joy ran through his veins as he thought of home and rose whose eyes by this time had grown so dim with looking for him god take me safely to her he whispered when up the mountain-side came the sound of voices and the tramp of feet creeping to the farthest side of the cave and crawling down beneath the shelving rock where the cool waters were dripping he hoped to avoid being seen up to this moment will's courage had never flagged but now when the federal lines were not many miles away and rose and home seemed certain he felt a great pang of fear and his white lips whispered god pity me god help me god save me for his own glory if not for rose's sake then knee-deep in the pool of water he stood with his body nearly double while the voices and the feet came nearer and at last stopped directly in front of his hiding-place there were terrible oaths outside and bitter denunciations were breathed against any luckless union man who might be lurking near and then the light from the entrance of the cave was wholly obscured and will saw that a man's back was against the opening as if someone were sitting there did they know of the cave would they come in there and if they did would they find him will kept asking himself these questions and his breath came gaspingly as he knew that the man whose back barred the entrance to his hiding-place was the bitterest in his invectives against the yankees and the most anxious to find them something in his voice and language indicated both education and position superior to his companions who evidently looked up to him as their leader calling him square and acquiescing readily when after the lapse of ten or fifteen minutes he suggested that they go higher up the mountain to a gorge where some of the fugitives had heretofore taken refuge five minutes more and the footsteps and voices were heard far up the mountain and will breathed more freely again and kneeling down in the pool of water thanked god who had turned the danger aside and kept him a little longer he did not dare leave the cave but he came out from under the rock and stretching himself upon the ground tried to wring and dry the tatters which hung so loosely upon him it was two days since he had tasted food and the long fast began to make itself felt in the keen pangs of hunger surely he could venture out toward the close of the day he thought and see if there were not berries growing in the ledges and when the sun was setting he crawled to the mouth of the cavern where just in the best place for him to see it lay a huge corn cake and a slice of bacon wrapped nicely in a bit of paper how it came there he did not stop to ask that it was there was sufficient for him then and never had the costliest dinner served on massive silver tasted to him half so well as did that bit of bacon with the coarse cornbread 
refreshed and encouraged he went back to his hiding-place intending to start again on his perilous journey when the mountain path grew dark enough to warrant him in doing so but soon after the sun-setting a fearful storm came up and in the pitchy darkness of the cave will listened to the bellowing thunder roaring through the mountain gorges and saw from the opening the forked lightning which struck more than one tall tree near the place of his concealment fed by the rain which had fallen in torrents the stream under the projecting rock was beginning to rise and spread itself over the surface of the cave it was up to his ankles now and it rose so rapidly that will was thinking of leaving the cave and groping his way as well as he could to the westward when his quick ear caught the sound as of two or more persons coming stealthily up the mountainside whoever they were they seemed to move with the utmost caution and will's heart beat high as he hoped it might be some brother fugitive seeking the shelter of the cave the gleam of a lantern however and the same voice he had heard in the morning cursing the yankees so bitterly dispelled that illusion and in a tremor of terror he drew back in his watery quarters crawling in the darkness to the farthest end of the cavern and feeling the rising water flow over his knees as he waited for what might come next stay here charlie while i go in i know he must be here and if he isn't drowned by this time it's just a special providence that's all i have to say surely that was no unfriendly voice notwithstanding the oath of the morning but still will did not move until the stranger who evidently knew every turn and nook of the cavern was so near him that the light from the dark lantern fell full upon his face and betrayed him at once there was a thought of rose and the freedom he had almost regained and then forgetting the friendly tones will gave a low bitter moan and stretching out his hand said imploringly kill me here as well as anywhere and let the suspense be ended kill you my boy and the stranger spoke cheerily as he bent over poor will and rubbed his clammy hands what should i kill you for i've had my eyes on you ever since yesterday evening when i saw you creeping under the brushwood and knew you were hunting for this cave the refuge of safety i call it and it has proved so to many a poor devil who like yourself has taken shelter here i have never known one to fail of reaching the happy land when once they got so far as this so cheer up my man paul haverhill can swear a string of swears about the yanks which will reach from here to richmond if necessary and then when the hounds are thrown off the track he can turn round and save the poor hunted rascal's life you are among your friends so come out from this puddle you must be wetter than a rat there's a spring under the rocks and it rises in a rain so as to fill the cave sometimes here charlie give us that shawl his teeth are fairly chattering thus talking the stranger who had announced himself as paul haverhill led will out to where the boy charlie stood holding a bright plaid shawl in his hand and looking curiously at the worn drooping sorry figure emerging from the cave it was a woman's shawl we all knew but it was very soft and warm and he wrapped it closely round him for he was shaking with cold and his tattered garments were wringing wet very few words were spoken and those in a whisper as they went cautiously down the mountain until they reached what seemed to be a road winding among the hills this they did not follow but striking into the field or pasture land beside it kept to the right and at a safe distance from it lest some straggler might be abroad and meet them face to face will mather was enough acquainted with southern customs not to be surprised to find here in the mountain wilds a substantial and even handsome-looking building which with its white walls and green blinds seemed much like the farmhouses in new england there was a light shining from the windows and a woman's brisk step was heard as they went toward the door paul haverhill coughing to give warning of his approach all right was the password by which they entered and will soon stood in the wide hall which ran through the entire building and opened in the rear upon a broad piazza better take him to miss maud's room the woman said and will followed on to an upper chamber which she would have known at once belonged to a young lady it was not as elegantly furnished as his own sleeping apartment at home but it bore unmistakable marks of taste and refinement while the air of pure gentle womanhood which pervaded it brought rose very vividly before him this is my niece's room maud de vere mr haverhill explained when they were alone and will was drying himself before the fire kindled by the woman who had admitted them and who will saw was a mulatto my niece is not at home now he continued she is in south carolina has been gone several months on a visit to old judge turnbridge her mother's uncle 
i am her mother's brother and she and the boy charlie have lived with me since the first year of the war their father was captain de vere from north carolina and was killed at the first bull run nelly their mother never held up her head after that i was with her when she died and brought the children home maud is twenty now and charlie fourteen i am their guardian maud is union charlie sesesh but safe they have a great deal of property here and there though how it will come through the war the lord only knows will was glad to see that his host was inclined to talk on without waiting for answers and he kept quiet while mr haverhill continued i dare say you wonder to find a chap like me among people who are so bitter against you yankees and i sometimes wonder at myself i am south carolina born and ought to be foremost in the rebellion but hanged if i can see that it is right why i might as well set up a government of my own here on the oak plantation and refuse to come under any civilized laws mind though i don't think the south all wrong not a bit of it the north did bully us and the election of mr lincoln was particularly obnoxious to the majority here but we had no right to secede and you did your duty trying to drive us back for a spell i kept quiet didn't take either side or if i did i wanted the south to beat as all my interests are here but when our folks got to abusing their prisoners so shamefully and told so many lies by way of deceiving us fellows who live among the hills and only get the news once or twice a week i changed my politics and after the day when i found one of my neighbours and the best man that ever breathed too hung to a tree like a dog with the word abolitionist pinned to his coat i made a vow that every energy i had should be given to caring for and helping just such wretches as you and if i've helped one i've helped a thousand why at least a hundred have slept in this very room maud's room for as i told you she is union to the backbone and led one chap across the mountain herself she is a regular die vernon and is not afraid of the very devil when she went away she bade me put them in here as the room less liable to suspicion to the folks around me i am the roughest kind of a secessionist and i suppose nobody can beat me swearing about the yankees just to hoodwink them you know i suppose that's wrong my wife would say so she was a saint when she was here she is an angel now she died five years ago before the war broke out and lois the woman you saw has been my housekeeper since i shouldn't like the north to take her from me they tried it once when a squad of em ransacked my house and i was sick in bed maud threatened to blow their brains out and sir she would have done it too if the scamps hadn't let lois alone i don't agree with your folks on the nigger question though none of mine has run away since the proclamation which i did not like they know too they are free or will be when the yankees come for i took pains to tell them and gave them liberty to cut stick for the federal lines as soon as they pleased but they stayed and great help i find them in the business i'm carrying on they are constantly on the lookout for runaways or refugees and are quite as good as bloodhounds to scent one they told me about you and i watched and saw you go into that cave which is on my land and which few know about or if they do they think it a spring hole and never dream that anybody can hide in there somebody else must have seen you too for word came that a man was hiding in the mountains and as the acknowledged leader of as hard a set as ever hunted a yankee i went with him to find you and carried in my pocket that bacon and corn bread which i managed to drop into the cave when i sat with my back against it i knew you must be hungry and it might be some time before i could come to your aid we didn't find the chap but to-morrow they'll be at it again and so while i help em hunt for a man about your build you will stay in the room in lois's charge maud has a good many jim cracks here such as books and things which may amuse you she is coming home by and by the house is very different then you ought to see maud we are very proud of her that's her picture only not half so good-looking and he pointed to a small oil painting hanging above the mantel it was a splendid head and the glossy black hair bound about it in heavy braids gave it a still more regal look the eyes too were black but very soft and gentle in their expression though something about them gave the impression that they might flash and blaze brilliantly under excitement it was a beautiful face and will did not wonder that his host was proud of his niece 
prouder even than of the pale-faced delicate boy who next day while the hunt for the runaway went on among the mountains tried to entertain will mather by telling him of his old home in north carolina and how happy they were there before the war came and took his father away i don't see it in the light uncle paul and sister do charlie said i don't want them to catch and torment the prisoners or murder folks who don't think as they do but i do want our side to succeed and when i hear of a victory i say hurrah for the confederacy i can't help it when i think of father who was killed by the yankees and all the trouble the war has brought i'm willing to work like a dog for the refugees and prisoners and i'd die sooner than betray one but if i was a man i'd join mr davis's army sure the pale face of the boy was flushed all over and his dark eyes burned with southern fire as he frankly avowed his sentiments and will mather could not repress a smile at this noble specimen of a southern rebel i like you my boy for your frankness he said and when the war is over i shall have to send for you to come north and be cured of your treason it is not treason and the boy stamped his girlish foot it is not treason any more than the views held by the revolutionary soldiers didn't the colonies secede from england and does anybody call washington a traitor now i tell you it is success which decides the nature of the thing if we succeed future historians will speak of us as patriots as a persecuted people who gave our lives in defence of our homes and firesides you won't succeed my poor boy the confederacy is gasping its last breath you will be conquered at the last and then what have you gained nothing nothing but ruin and the tears poured over the white face of this defender of southern rights soon recovering himself however he exclaimed proudly we may be conquered but not subjugated you can't do that with all your countless hordes of men and your millions of money the north can never subjugate the south we may lay down our arms because we have no other alternative but we shall still think the same and feel the same way as we do now here was a curious study for will mather who was surprised to find such maturity of thought and so strong determination in one so young and frail no wonder it is hard to conquer a people composed of such elements he thought and he was about to continue the conversation when he was startled by a loud blast from a horn among the hills they've caught some one they always do that as a kind of exaltation the boy exclaimed wringing his hands and evincing as much distress as he had heretofore shown bitterness against the opposing party it was a poor refugee from a neighbouring county whom in spite of paul haverhill's precautions they had found in a hollow tree and whom they brought more dead than alive down to the oak plantation amid vociferous cries of tar and feather him hang him to a sour apple tree give him a taste of the halter make him an example to all other sneakin yankee sympathizers with his face as white as marble and his lips set firmly together paul haverhill stood in the midst of the noisy group which he tried to quiet let us try him by jury he said and something in his voice reassured the frightened haggard wretch who had seen his house burned down and his son shot before his very eyes and of course expected no mercy the trial by jury proved popular and then paul haverhill suggested that a judge be chosen in the person of some one who had lost a near friend in the war and was of course competent to mete out full justice to the criminal charlie for instance and his eye fell on the boy who had joined the crowd and was standing close to the prisoner the boy caught his uncle's meaning at once and exclaimed yes let me be the judge my father was killed at bull run my mother died of grief surely i may decide charlie de vere was a favourite with the men who knew how staunch a confederate he was and waiving the trial for want of time they said charlie shall decide whether we hang drown whip or tar and feather the prisoner at the bar then with far more energy and fire than had characterized his vindication of the south charlie de vere pleaded for the criminal that they would let him go just this once for father's sake and mine and maud's he said and at the mention of maud the dark brows began to clear and the scowling faces grew more lenient in their expression for maud de vere was worshipped by the rough men of the mountains who though they knew her sympathies were on the union side made an exception in her favour and held her person and opinions sacred for her sake they would let their captive go giving him warning to leave the neighbourhood at once nor let himself be seen again in their midst while the war lasted and thus it chanced that will mather had a companion in his wanderings which were renewed the following day 
the boy charlie acting as guide through the most dangerous part of the way and at last bidding him good-bye with great tears in his eyes as he said i hope you won't be caught but i don't know the woods are full of our soldiers travel at night and hide through the day trust no one but the negroes and if you are captured ask for mercy in sister's name everybody knows maud de vere twenty eight the dead alive it was the night of the third of july the anniversary as she supposed of her husband's death and rose was sitting up unusually late she could not sleep for thinking of one year ago and the white-faced man who lay upon the battlefield with the rain falling upon him it was a clear starlight night and she leaned many times from her open window and looked up at the kindly eyes keeping watch above her but she did not see the figure coming down the street and up the walk to their own door the figure of a worn-out soldier who from the prison at salisbury had escaped to tennessee and had come from thence straight on until the midnight train dropped him at the rockland station the light was behind her and will saw her distinctly as he went up the avenue and he stopped a moment to look at her she was very pale and much thinner than when he saw her last but never even on her bridal day had she seemed so beautiful to him as then when leaning from her window and apparently listening for something it was the sound of his footsteps as he came up the walk which had attracted her attention and when it ceased so suddenly as he stopped under the trees she felt a momentary pang of fear for burglars had been very common in the town that summer possibly this was one of the robbers and rose was thinking of alarming the house when the figure emerged from under the shadow of the trees and came directly up beneath the window while a voice which made rose's blood curdle in her veins called softly rose darling is it you had the dead come back to life was that her husband's voice and that his step in the lower hall rose had supposed the front door bolted she had not heard it open and now when the steps sounded upon the stairs her heart gave one throb of fear as all the old superstitious stories of new england lore rushed to her mind perhaps on this anniversary of his death he had come back to see her and perhaps rose did not finish the sentence for the opening of her own door disclosed the wasted figure of a man wearing the army blue his face very pale but lighted up with perfect joy as he stretched his arms toward the shrinking woman by the window and said come to me darling i am no ghost then she went to him but uttered no sound her heart was too full for that and seemed bursting from her throat as she laid her head upon the bosom of her husband and felt his arms around her waist and neck her stillness frightened him it was so unlike her and lifting her from the floor he took her in his lap and said to her speak to me rose let me hear your voice once more you thought i was dead and you've been so sorry yes killed at gettysburg came gaspingly at last and then a storm of tears and kisses fell upon will's face and rose's arms were thrown about his neck as she tried to tell him how great was her joy to have him back again i have been so lonely she said for everybody is gone jimmy and danny and poor tom too is a prisoner at last so mother and i are all alone except just then it occurred to her that her husband had no suspicion of the great joy in store for him how shall i tell him she thought and her eyes went from his face to the basket and chair where baby's clothes were lying the little white dress with its shoulder knots of blue the flannels and the soft wool socks were all there in plain sight will saw them too as his eye followed rose's rose tell me what is that what does it mean he asked and then without a word rose led him into the adjoining room where in his crib slumbered her beautiful boy their beautiful boy rather he was hers alone no longer for the father was there now and the happiest moment he had ever known was that when he knelt by his baby's cradle and felt how much he had for which to thank his maker he could not wait till morning before he heard the sound of his first-born's voice and he took him at once in his arms every pulse thrilling with pride and exquisite delight as he felt the soft baby hands in his own and looked into the beautiful dark eyes which met his so wonderingly as baby awoke and gazed up into his face it was not afraid of him and rose almost danced with joy as she saw it smile in his father's face and then turned slyly away 
it was so terrible till baby came last christmas she said beginning to explain how they believed him dead and how much she had suffered even baby did not make me glad as it ought she continued for i could not forget how happy you would have been to come home and find him here and now you've come god is very very good i love him now will better i hope than i love you or baby or anything i've given baby to him and given myself too but he had to punish me so hard before i would do it then together the reunited couple knelt and thanked the father who had remembered them so mercifully and asked that henceforth their lives might be dedicated to his service and all they had be subject to his will there was no more sleep in the mather mansion that night for by the time mrs carleton and the servants had recovered from their surprise and joy the early morning was red in the east and the sun was just beginning to show the returned soldier how pleasant and beautiful his home was looking the people of rockland had not intended to have much of a celebration on that fourth of july the churchyard was too full of soldiers graves and the war clouds were still too dark over the land while the battle of the wilderness where so many had perished was too fresh in their minds to admit of much festivity but when it was known that will mather had come home the town was all on fire with excitement every bell was rung and the cannon of bill baker memory bellowed forth its welcome while in the evening impromptu fireworks attested to the people's delight then followed many days of delicious quiet in which will told his wife and mother the story of his wanderings but said very little of his life in salisbury that was something he could not mention without a shudder and so he passed it over in silence choosing rather to tell of his journey across the mountains where so many friendly hands had been stretched out to help him he had every name upon paper and was only waiting for an opportunity to show his gratitude in some tangible form especially was he grateful to paul haverell whose name became a household word together with that of charlie and maud de vere of her rose thought so often wishing she could see her and resolving when the war was over either to write at once or go all the way to the mountains of tennessee to find her poor tom she often sighed if he could only fall into so friendly hands but everything pertaining to tom was shrouded in gloom the last they heard he was in columbia while jimmy still pined in andersonville if indeed he had not died amid its horrors exchanged prisoners were constantly arriving at annapolis where both mrs sims and annie were and every letter from the latter was eagerly torn open by rose in hopes that it might contain some news of her brothers but there was none and the mourning garments which with her husband's return were exchanged for lighter airier ones seemed only laid aside for a few weeks until word should come that one or both of her brothers were in the dead whose graves were far away beneath a southern sky End of chapters 27 and 28chapter 29 of rose mather a tale by mary jane holmes this librivox recording is in the public domain twenty nine the heroine of the mountain of the three captives will mather jimmy and tom the latter had suffered the least as a prisoner of war a strong freemason he had found friends at columbia where chance threw in his way a near relation of his dead wife and a former classmate though firmly believing in the southern cause joe haskell from the first befriended captain carleton whom he finally helped to escape giving him money and so far as he was able directions where to go and whom to ask for aid tom's imprisonment had been of short duration and thus it was with vigour unimpaired and spirits unbroken that he found himself free on that very night when will mather lay sleeping in the cave among the mountains of tennessee but that refuge of safety was many many miles away and tom's route to the land of freedom was a longer and far more dangerous one than will's had been still tom had in his favour health and strength together with a knack of passing himself off as a southerner whenever an opportunity was presented and so for a week or more he proceeded with comparatively little trouble but at the end of that time dangers and difficulties beset him at every step while more than once death or recapture stared him in the face either from the close proximity of his pursuers or the pertinacity of the bloodhounds which were set upon his track escape at times seemed impossible 
and tom's courage and strength were beginning to give way when one night toward the last of june he found himself in a negro cabin and an occupant of a bed whose covering though impregnated with the peculiar odour of the sable-hued faces around him seemed the very embodiment of sweetness and cleanliness to the tired and footsore man who nearly all his life has slept in the finest linen with lace or silken hangings about his bed for linen now there was a ragged quilt and the bed was festooned with cobwebs while from the blackened rafters hung bundles of herbs and strings of peppers alternated here and there with the grimy articles of clothing which old hetty had washed that day for her own boys and in consequence of the rain had hung in her cabin to dry coarse heavy shirts they were but tom as he watched them drying on the pole fell to coveting the uncouth things and thought how soft and nice they would feel on his rough flesh then he thought of home and rose and wondered what she would say could she look in upon him in that negro hut with all those stalwart boys sitting by while hetty their mother cooked the corn cake and fried the slice of bacon for supper two sat just where tom could see them while the third was near the door keeping a constant watch on the circuitous path leading from the cabin to a large dwelling on the knoll marsher's house where to-night a number of young people were assembled in honour of the return of the son and heir lieutenant arthur who had been in so many battles and had a taste of prison life at the north though bitterly opposed to the unionists arthur was truthful almost to a fault as some of his auditors thought to whom he was recounting the incidents of his prison life comfortable beds decent bread well-cooked meat with plenty of pure air and water he had received from the hands of his enemies and once when for a few days he was sick he had been fed with toast and jelly and tea quite as good as hetty could make he said and while he talked more than one present thought of the southern prisons where so many men were dying from starvation and neglect and one young girl's eyes flashed angrily and her nostrils quivered with passion as she burst out with the exclamation that's the story most of our prisoners tell when they come back to us think you a like report would be carried north if the poor wretches ever lived to get there i think it's a shame to allow such suffering in our midst this speech which had in it the ring of unionism did not startle the hearers as much as might be expected they were accustomed to maude de vere's outspoken way and they knew that when she first came among them she was on the federal side and had opposed the secession movement with all the force of her girl nature as yet no harm had been threatened her for maude was one to whom all paid deference and her clear arguments touching the right of secession had done much toward keeping alive a feeling of humanity for our prisoners in the family where for months she had been a guest squire turnbridge or judge as he was frequently called was her near relative and as his only daughter had died only two years before and he was very lonely in his great house he had invited maude to visit him and insisted upon her staying as long as possible at first he had laughed at her yankee preferences but when the deaths at salisbury and andersonville increased so fast he shook his head sadly and protested against the cruelty and neglect of the government he did not believe in killing men by inches he said better shoot them at once and still he would not willingly have harboured a runaway on his premises for fear of the odium which would attach to him if the fact were known and so when late that night while tom lay sleeping in hetty's cabin and hetty up at the big house was waiting upon the guests and making secret signs to maude de vere there came a band of men into the yard in pursuit of an escaped yankee the squire roused at once saying that no one could possibly be hidden on his plantation unless the blacks had secreted him the negro houses were close by they could look for themselves he had supposed his servants loyal but there was no telling in these perilous times and the old man's face flushed as his southern blood fired his zeal for the southern cause in her evening dress of white with her bands of glossy black hair bound like a coronet around her regal brow maude de vere stood leaning upon the piano her eyes shining like burning coals and her lips slightly parted as she listened to the conversation and then darted an anxious glance toward the spot where hetty had been standing a moment before but hetty had disappeared and under cover of darkness was running and rolling and slipping down the steep wet path which led to her cabin door arrived there she seized the sleeping tom by the arm and exclaimed wake up master for de dear lord's sake de secessioner is come and will be here in a minute i'm mighty afraid even miss maud can't save you tom was awake in a moment and fully alive to the danger of his condition from the house on the knoll he could hear the excited voices of his pursuers and the sound made every pulse throb with fear tell me what to do he said 
and hetty replied kin you bar smotherin for a spell if you kin get under de old straw tick and lie right still and flat and you hell buckle into masser's place as if twas you who've been lyin here all the time tom did not hesitate a moment and had just straightened himself under the straw bed and drawn a long breath as he felt harry's body settling down above him when steps were heard coming down the path and a young man's voice asked of hetty if she had any strangers there any yankees you know because if you have the young man paused a moment and peered out into the night to make sure that no one was listening then in a whisper he added keep them safe and remember fleetfoot knows all the passes of the mountains between here and tennessee a suppressed thank god might almost have been heard beneath the straw bed while old hetty exclaimed the lord bless Master arthur and miss maud too i know it is her doin's and hetty was right for tom carleton owed his escape from that great peril to maud de vere rather than to lieutenant arthur when the order was given to search the negro quarters arthur had seen that in maud's face which constrained him to follow her when she beckoned him to come out upon the piazza arthur she said putting her lips to his ear remember the kind treatment you received from your enemies and be merciful don't let them find him for there is a yankee soldier down in hetty's cabin she told me to-night search her house yourself throw them off the track anything to mislead them be merciful do it arthur for my sake always beautiful maud de vere was dazzlingly so now as she stood before the young officer pleading for tom carleton and arthur turnbridge was more influenced by her beauty than by any party feelings assuming a fierce determined manner he went back to the pursuers and said it's perfectly preposterous that one of those unionists should come here for protection when it is well known what we are still it may be there's no piece of effrontery they are not capable of i know them well just as i knew every nook and corner of the negro cabins stay here gentlemen and take some refreshment while i search the quarters myself arthur turnbridge wore a lieutenant's uniform he had been in the army from the very first he had fought in many a battle had been prisoner for four months while his father was known to be a staunch secessionist who was ready to sacrifice all he had for the success of the cause he believed to be so just and righteous there could be no cheating in such a family as this and so while maud de vere wore her most winning smile and with her own hands served cake and coffee to the soldiers lieutenant arthur went on his tour of investigation and brought back word that not a trace of a runaway had he found notwithstanding that every cabin on the premises had been visited a savage oath was the answer to this report but something in maud's eyes kept the soldiers in check and made them tolerably civil as they mounted their horses and with a respectful good-night rode off in an opposite direction with a feeling of security after hearing from hetty of maud de vere tom came out from his hiding-place and ventured to open the door of the cabin where he stood looking at the big house on the hill from which the guests were just departing he could hear their voices as they said good-night and fancied he would detect the clear well-bred tones of maud de vere in whom he began to feel so deeply interested he could see the flutter of her white dress as she stood against a pillar of the piazza with arthur at her side but her back was toward him and he could only see her well-shaped head which sat so erect and proudly upon her shoulders she was very tall tom thought comparing her with mary annie and petite rose as she walked across the piazza with arthur who from comparison seemed the shorter of the two profoundly grateful to her as his probable deliverer tom went back into the cabin and began to question hetty with regard to the young lady who was she and where did she live and how came she so strong a unionist she's miss maud de vere bred and born in the old north state somewheres near tar run aunt hetty said her father was killed at first bull run and then her mother died and she went to live with her uncle off toward tennessee and the hills she's got an awful sight of money and heaps of niggers lazy no-count critters who just do nothing from morn till night she and miss nettie master turnbridge's gal was great friends at school and miss maud was here when she died and has been here by spells ever since young master thinks she mighty nice but dis child don't exactly know what miss ma do think of him reckon he's too short or too sessionary to suit her 
this was hetty's account of the young lady who at that very moment was listening with a defiant look upon her face to arthur turnbridge's remonstrance against what he termed her treasonable principles they will get you into trouble yet the war is not over as some would have you think the north is greatly divided be warned of me maud and do not run such risks as you do by openly avowing your union sentiments think what it would be to me if harm should befall you maud arthur spoke very gently now while a deep flush mounted to his beardless cheek but met with no reflection from maud de vere's face only her eyes kindled and grew blacker if possible as she listened to him first with scorn when he spoke of treason and then with pity when he spoke of himself and the pain it would cause him if harm should come to her maud knew very well the nature of the feelings with which her kinsman young arthur turnbridge regarded her at first she had been disposed to laugh at him and his preference for an amazon as she styled herself but arthur had proved by actual measurement that in point of height he excelled her by half an inch while the register showed that in point of age he had the advantage of her by more than four years though maud seemed the elder of the two don't be foolish arthur nor entertain fears for me she said i am not afraid of general lee's entire army nor grant's either for that matter my home at uncle paul's has been beset alternately by either party and i have held a loaded pistol at the heads of both federal and confederate when one was for leading away charlie's favorite horse and the other for coaxing off old lois to cook the company's rations no i am not afraid and if necessary i will guide that poor wretch down in hetty's cabin safely to tennessee arthur's face grew dark at once and he said half angrily maud let that man alone let them all alone it is not womanly for you to evince so much interest in such people for your sake i'll help this one get away but that must be the last and remember it is done for your sake with the expectation of reward do you consent to the terms maud's nostrils quivered as she drew her tall figure to its full height and answered back i could not prize the love i had to buy no arthur i have told you once that you are only my brother just as nettie was my sister believe me arthur i cannot give you what you ask she spoke gently kindly now for she pitied the young man whose sincerity she did not doubt but whose love she could not return he was not her equal either physically or mentally and the man who won maude de vere must be one to whom she could look up to as a superior such a one she would make very happy but she would lead arthur a wretched miserable life and she knew it and would save him from herself even though there were many kindly tender feelings in her heart for the young lieutenant she saw that he was angry with her and as further conversation was useless she left him and repaired to her room the windows of which overlooked hetty's cabin and there until daylight the noble girl sat watching lest their unwelcome visitors of the previous night failing to find their victim should return and insist upon another search as maude de vere said she had held a loaded pistol at the head of both federal and confederate when her uncle was sick and the house was beset one week by one of the belligerent parties and the following week by the other she was afraid of nothing and tom carleton so long as she stood his sentinel had little to fear from his pursuers but she could not ward off the fever which for many days had been lurking in his veins and which was increasing so fast that when the morning came he was too sick to rise and lay moaning with the pain in his eyes and complaining of the heat which in that dark corner of the closed cabin and on that sultry summer morning was intolerable mighty poorly with face as red as them flowers in your hair and the veins in his forehead as big as my leg was the word which hetty brought up to maude de vere the next morning and half an hour later maude in her pale buff cambric wrapper with her black hair shining like satin went down to hetty's cabin and stood beside tom carleton he was sleeping for a few moments and the drops of perspiration were standing on his forehead and about his lips he was not worn and emaciated like most of the prisoners and refugees whom maude had seen his complexion though bronzed from exposure had not that peculiar greyish appearance common to so many of the returned prisoners while his forehead was very white and his rich brown hair damp with the perspiration clung about it in the soft round curls so natural to it there was nothing in his personal appearance to awaken sympathy on the score of ill-treatment and yet maude felt strangely drawn toward him guessing with a woman's quick perception that he was somewhat above many whom it had been her privilege to befriend and maude being human did not like him less for that 
on the contrary she the more readily brushed away the flies which were alighting upon his face and with her own handkerchief wiped the moisture from his brow and then felt his rapid pulse he ought not to stay in this place she said and she was revolving the propriety of boldly asking squire turnbridge if he might be removed to the house when tom awoke and turned wonderingly toward her he knew it was maud de vere and something in her face riveted his attention making him wonder where he had seen somebody very like her you are sick she said to him kindly as he attempted to rise on his elbow and fell back again upon the squalid bed i am afraid you are very sick but you are safe here that is yes i know you are safe none but fiends would betray a sick man she spoke rapidly and tom saw the bright colour deepen in her cheek and her eyes flash with excitement she was very beautiful and tom felt the influence of her beauty and tried to draw the ragged quilt over him so as to hide the coarse grey shirt hetty had given him and which was as unlike the immaculate linen tom carleton was accustomed to wear as it was possible to be you are miss de vere i am sure he said and you are very kind i shall not tax your hospitality long i hope to go on to-night don't stay here miss de vere you must be uncomfortable it's hotter here than in massachusetts you are from new england then maud asked and tom replied from boston yes your people hate us most of all i believe and tom tried to smile while maud answered him it makes no difference to me whether you are from maine or oregon you are sick and have come to us for succour i'll do what i can to help you with the last words she was gone her tall lithe figure bending gracefully under the low doorway and the rustle of her fresh clean garments leaving a pleasant sound in tom carleton's ears a sick yankee down in hetty's cabin a boston one at that with his wendell phillips notions and you want me to let him be brought up to this house the house of a southern gentleman who if he hates one of the dogs worse than another hates the massachusetts kind whose women have nothing to do but to write abolition books about our niggers no indeed he shall not come an inch and by the hairy i'll send for the authorities and have him bundled off to jail before night with his camp fever and his boston airs needn't talk see if i don't do it and i'll have hetty strung up and whipped for harbouring the villain treason under my very nose and a yankee too go away go away i tell you i won't hear you i hate em all for the cussedness there is in em this was squire turnbridge's reply to maud de vere who had told him of tom carleton and asked permission to have him moved up to the house nothing daunted maud went close up to him and her beautiful eyes looked straight into his as she said think if it was arthur sick among his enemies they were kind to him he says and remember nettie too had she lived she would have married a northern man you liked robert and nettie loved him for her sake let this man be brought to the house he will die there where it is so close serve him right for coming down here to fight us wish they were all dead how are you going to get the rascal up that confounded hill can he walk maud had gained her point and with mrs turnbridge who had a soft kind heart she hastened to make ready a large airy chamber somewhat remote from the rooms occupied by the family and their frequent guests it was not the best room in the house but he would be safer there than elsewhere and maud made it as inviting as possible by pulling the bed out from the corner to the centre of the room covering the plain stand with a clean white towel and the table with a gaily coloured shawl of her own then with hetty and one of hetty's sons she started for the cabin followed by the squire himself since the war began he had not seen a yankee and curiosity as much as anything took him to tom carleton whom he assailed with a string of epithets telling him to see what he'd got by making war on people so much better than himself good enough for you he continued as assisted by hetty and clabe tom tried to walk up the winding path with maud in front and the squire in the rear yes good enough for you if you die like a dog and i dare say you will fevers go hard with you bunker hill chaps clabe you villain you are letting him fall don't you see he hasn't strength to walk carry him you rascal 
and thus changing the nature of his tirade the squire thrust his cane against tom's back by way of assisting him up the hill he was human if he was not quite consistent and his face was very red and he was very much out of breath when the house was reached at last and tom was comfortably disposed in bed for thunder's sake hetty take that grey niggery thing off from him the squire said pointing to the coarse shirt tom had thought so nice when he exchanged it for his dirty uniform if you women are going to do a thing do it decent arthur's shirts won't fit him i reckon for arthur ain't bigger than a pint of cider but mine will fetch him one and for gracious sake souse him first in the bathtub he needs it bad for them prison pens ain't none the neatest according to the tell in spite of his aversion to the boston yankees the judge had taken the ordering of this one into his own hands and it was to him that tom owed the refreshing bath which did him so much good and abated the force of the fever which nevertheless ran high for many days during which time maud nursed him as carefully as if he had been her brother arthur was absent when the moving occurred but when he found out that it was done and the yankee was actually an inmate of his father's house he concluded to make the best of it merely remarking that they would be in a pretty mess if the story got out of there harbouring a prisoner the judge knew that and in fancy he saw his house burned down and himself perhaps ridden on a rail by his justly incensed neighbours the fear wore upon him terribly until a new idea occurred to him maud as everybody knew had long been talking of going back to tennessee and what more natural than for paul haverhill to send an escort for her in the person of some cousin or other who was foolish enough to fall sick immediately after his arrival this was a smart thought and as that very day at least a dozen people called at the cedars as the judge called his place so the dozen were told of john camp sick a bed upstairs kind of cousin to maud and sent to see her home by her uncle paul right smart chap the judge said feeling amazed at the facility with which he invented falsehoods when once he began been a gorilla there in the mountains and done some tall fightin i reckon this was the judge's story which his auditors believed wondering some of them why the visitor should occupy that back chamber in preference to the handsome rooms in front still they had no suspicion of the truth john camp was accepted as a reality and kind inquiries were made after his welfare as day after day the fever ran its course and maud de vere bent over him bathing his forehead smoothing his pillows and brushing his hair her white fingers insinuating queer fancies into his brain as half unconscious he felt their touch upon his face and saw the soft eyes above him at first arthur had kept aloof from tom but as the latter grew better he yielded to maud's entreaties and went in to see him feeling intuitively that he was in the presence of a gentleman as well as of a superior he could not dislike him for there was something about tom carleton which disarmed him of all prejudice and many a quiet friendly talk the two had together on the all-absorbing topic of the day he is a splendid fellow if he is a yankee was arthur's mental verdict and fine-looking too finer a hundred times than i and then there crept into his heart a fear lest maud should think as he did and ere he was aware of it he found himself fiercely jealous of one who was at his mercy and whom if he chose he might have removed so easily End of chapter twenty nine chapters thirty and thirty one of rose mather a tale by mary jane holmes this librivox recording is in the public domain thirty arthur and maud tom carleton was able to start on his journey westward twice he had left his room and joined the family below making himself so agreeable and adapting himself so nicely to all the judge's crotchets that the old man confessed to a genuine liking for the yankee rascal and expressed himself as unwilling to part with him he had inquired into his family history and to his infinite delight found that the elder carleton tom's father was the very lawyer whose speech years ago had been instrumental in sending back to bondage the judge's runaway negro hetty's husband whose grave was out by the garden wall and whose wife and sons had rendered so different a service to the lawyer's son tom's face was scarlet when he thought of the difference and remembered how his father had worked to prove that the master was entitled to his property wherever it was found the judge suspected the nature of his thoughts and with a forced laugh said good-humouredly you are more of an abolitionist than your father was i see 
well well young man times change and we change with them old man carleton did me a good turn for seth was worth two thousand dollars i never abused him nor gave him a blow when i got him back i only asked him how he liked freedom as far as he had gone and he didn't answer he seemed broke down like and in less than a year he died he was the best hand i ever had more'n half white i cried when he died i'll be hanged if i didn't i told him to live and i'd set him free and when i see how his eyes lighted up i made out his papers on the spot and brought em to him and he died with em in his hand held so tight we could scarcely get em out and i had em buried with him in his coffin thank you masser god bless you for letting me die free but it's come too late i would worked for you masser all the same if you'd done this before i wanted to be a man and not a thing a brute you have been kind to me masser thank you thank you for liberty these are seth's very words i got em by heart and i said them so much that i began to wonder if freedom wasn't better than slavery but bless you my niggers was about all i had i couldn't give em up though i used to go out to seth's grave and think how he hugged the papers to the last and wonder if the clause all men are born free and equal didn't mean the blacks but the pesky war broke out and drove all this from my head i hate the yankees i hate lincoln i hate the whole union army though i'll be blamed if i can hate you got a wife eh he turned abruptly to his guest who had listened with so breathless interest to the story of poor seth that he did not see maude de vere her eyes shining and her cheeks flushed as if she were under some strong excitement between herself and arthur there had been a long conversation concerning captain tom carleton and other matters of greater interest to maud the john camp ruse had succeeded well and maud had a fancy for making it do still more by taking her patient in safety as far as her uncle haverill's she had received several letters from her uncle urging her to come home and in a week at most she was going as one who had been expressly sent as her escort mr carleton would of course go with her and in order to make the journey with perfect safety she would have arthur go too and it was of this that she had spoken to him that morning when she found him in a little summer-house at the rear of the long garden there was a dark shadow on arthur's face as he listened to maud's proposition and when she had finished speaking he replied i intend to go with you provided i'm not ordered back to the army but maud i will not have that yankee soldier hanging on to us we have done that for him which imperils our lives and now that he is able to go on let him take his chance alone if he is one half as keen as yankees think themselves to be he will get through unharmed no i won't have him in our way but think of the dangers to be encountered the hordes of guerrillas which infest the mountains maud pleaded and in her earnestness she laid both her hands on arthur's shoulders and stood leaning over him maud de vere and arthur spoke very decidedly why are you so much interested in this man tell me and tell me truly too have you learned to care for him more than you would for a common soldier had such a one come to you as a runaway yankee if you have maud and arthur's face was white with determination if you have by the heavens above us i'll put a bullet through him myself or worse than that send him back to where he came from that would be an act worthy of a turnbridge and a southern gentleman maud said bitterly and something in her tone warned arthur that he had gone too far so changing his tactics he said more gently sit here beside me maud and listen to what i have to say you know that i have loved you ever since i knew the meaning of the word and it is not in my nature to give up what my heart is set upon you have refused me but that does not matter i want you for my wife i must have you for my wife i know you are my superior and i am willing it should be so you can fashion me into anything you like i have screened and hidden and lied for that yankee carleton just to gratify you and when i first consented to act the traitor's part i supposed he was most likely some coarse ignorant boor but he is not returning health shows him to be a well-bred gentleman and decidedly good-looking so much so that i have been jealous of him maud not knowing to what your strange opinions might lead you you know of course he has a wife dropped scornfully from maud's lips and arthur started quickly no maud i did not know it how came you by the knowledge did he tell you so not directly 
but when he was out of his head or asleep he talked of rose and annie and mary and he called the latter his wife that is the way i know maud said and arthur's face cleared at once forgive me maud i was a fool to be jealous of him and now let us come to a final understanding you have laughed at and browbeaten and queened it over me for years but i have never despaired of winning you at last once for all then will you be my wife i must have you i cannot be denied arthur was in earnest now and his pleadings were eloquent with the love he felt for the girl who listened in silence and then said to him arthur it cannot be i should make you very unhappy we do not agree in any one point but we will agree i promise to conform to your opinions in everything i'll guide this man to tennessee and give myself in future to the work of saving and helping the entire yankee army i'll be a second dan ellis if you like i'll do anything but take the oath to the union i've sworn to stand by the other side i cannot break my word even for you maud maud did not like him less for that last there was southern fire in her heart as well as his and southern blood in her veins and though she clung to the old flag there were moments when she felt a flush of pride in her misguided brothers who fought so like heroes and believed so heartily in their cause say maud arthur continued will you be my wife if i will do all this think how many lives i might save and how much suffering relieve there are so many chances where i could do good for no one would suspect me give me some hope maud speak to me she was sitting with her face buried in her hands as many another maiden has sat counting the cost all her life long arthur turnbridge had followed her with his love till she was tired of the contest nothing she had ever said disheartened him no rebuff however severe had availed to keep him quiet she knew he loved her and perhaps she might in time love him it would make the old judge and his wife so happy while charlie liked arthur so much other people liked him too he was very popular and she well knew that she was envied by many a proud maiden for the attentions of the agreeable lieutenant turnbridge besides if arthur pledged himself to help the escape of prisoners he would keep his word and so through her much good might be done and hearts made happy perhaps others had willingly sacrificed their lives for their country and why should she shrink from sacrificing her happiness if by it so many lives could be saved was it not her duty to cast self aside and think only of the suffering she could relieve with arthur as her ally maud was selling herself for her country and with one great throb of bitter pain she said at last i will deal frankly with you arthur as i always have you are not disagreeable to me i like you very much as a friend i miss you when you are away and i am glad when you come back still you are not just what i have imagined my future husband to be i like you for the good i know there is in you and i may learn to love you i shall lead you a horrid life if i do not for it is not in my nature to affect what i do not feel if i cannot love you i shall learn to hate you and that will be terrible she was looking at him now and though he winced a little beneath the blazing eyes she looked so grand so beautiful that foolish youth as he was he fancied her hate would be preferable to losing her and so he said go on maud i am not afraid of the hatred if you always look as you do now something like contempt leaped to her eyes then but she put it aside and continued i will promise only on conditions you shall see this mr carleton safely to my uncle paul's you shall befriend and help every runaway you chance to find you shall relieve every suffering union soldier when an opportunity occurs you shall use your influence for the prisoners and seek to ameliorate their wretched condition if you do this arthur and do it faithfully when the war is over i will try to answer yes are you satisfied it was a very one-sided affair and arthur knew it but love for maud de vere was the strongest passion of which he was capable and he answered i am satisfied and he kissed the cold hand which maud placed in his and thought what a regal creature he had won and thought too how implicitly he would keep the contract even if it involved a giving up of jefferson davis himself into the enemy's hands thirty one maud and tom it was then that maud left him and went back to the house where standing in the door she scanned the face and person of the man for whose safety in part she had pledged her heart and hand 
tom's tout ensemble was good and there was about him a certain air of grace and culture which showed itself in every movement a stranger would have trusted him in a moment and recognized the true manhood in his expressive face and maud recognized it as she never had before and the contrast between him and arthur struck her plainfully if arthur were more like him i could love him better she thought just as the judge asked the abrupt question you have a wife eh of course he has maud thought and still she listened for the answer my wife died some years ago before the war broke out she was a mary williams a near relative of the williamses of charleston perhaps you know them know em i'll bet i do the finest family in the state and you married one of them the old judge said his manner indicating an increased respect for the man who had married a williams of charleston maud knew the family too or rather knew of them and remembered how some years before when she was at st mary's she had heard a charleston young lady speaking of a mrs carleton from boston who had recently died and whose husband had been so kind and patient and tender and was the most perfectly splendid-looking man she ever saw maud remembered this last distinctly because it had called forth a reproof from the teacher who had overheard it and who asked what kind of a man the most perfectly splendid-looking one could be maud had not thought of that incident in years but it came back to her now as she stood close to the man who had been so kind and tender to his sick dying wife he would be all that she knew for his manner was so quiet and grave and gentle and then a great throb of pain swept over maud de vere as she thought of arthur and the pledge she had given him maud could not analyze her feelings or understand why the knowing who tom carleton was and that he was also free should make the world so desolate all of a sudden and blot out the brightness of the summer day which had seemed so pleasant at its beginning i did it in part for him she said feeling that in spite of her pain there was something sweet even in such a sacrifice she was still standing in the door when tom turning a little more toward his host saw her his face lighting up at once and the smile which made him so handsome breaking out about his mouth and showing his fine teeth ah miss de vere take this seat and with that well-bred politeness so much part of his family he arose and offered her his chair but maud declined it and took a seat instead upon a little camp-stool near to the vine-wreathed columns of the piazza it was very pleasant there that morning and maud sitting against that background of green leaves made a very pretty picture in her pink cambric wrapper trimmed with white white pendants in her ears and a bunch of sweet-scented heliotrope in her hair and at her throat where the smooth linen collar came together and tom enjoyed the picture very much from the crown of satin hair to the high-heeled slipper with its bright ribbon rosette it was not a little slipper like those which used to be in tom's dressing-room in boston when mary was alive nor yet like the fairy things which rose mather wore nothing about maud de vere was small but everything was admirably proportioned she wore a seven glove and she wore a four boot she measured just twenty-five inches around the waist and five feet six from her head to her feet and weighed one hundred and forty a perfect amazon she called herself but tom did not think so he knew she was a large type of womanhood but she was perfect in form and feature and he would not have had her one whit smaller than she was neither did he contrast her with any one he had ever known she was so wholly unlike mary and rose and annie that comparison between them was impossible she was miss de vere maud he called her to himself and the name was beginning to sound sweetly to him as he daily grew more and more intimate with the queenly creature who bore it he had buried his pale proud-faced but loving mary he had given up the gentle annie and surely he might think of maud de vere if he chose and the sight of her sitting there before him with the rich colour in her cheek and the southern fire in her eyes stirred strange feelings in his heart and made him so forgetful of what the judge was saying to him that the old man at last rose and walked away leaving the two young people alone together tom had never talked much to maud except upon sick-room topics and he felt anxious to know if her mind corresponded with her face and form here was a good opportunity for testing her mental powers and in the long earnest conversation which ensued concerning men and books and politics tom sifted her thoroughly experiencing that pleasure which men of cultivation always experience when thrown in contact with a woman whose intelligence and endowments are equal to their own 
Maud's education had not been a superficial one, nor had it ceased with her leaving school. In her room at home there was a small library of choice books, which she read and studied each day together with her brother Charlie, whose education she superintended. Few persons north or south were better acquainted with the incidents and progress of the war than she was. She had watched it from its beginning, and with her father, from whom she had inherited her superior mind, she had held many earnest argumentative discussions concerning the right and wrong of secession. Maud had opposed it from the first, but her father had thought differently, and carrying out his principles had lost his life in the first battle of Bull Run. Maud spoke of him to Tom, and her fine eyes were full of tears as she told of the dark, terrible days which preceded and followed the news of his death. The ball which struck him down went further than that. It killed mother, too, and made us orphans, Maud said, and something in the tone of her voice and the expression of her face puzzled Tom just as it had many times before, and carried him back to Bull Run, where it seemed to him he had seen a face like Maud de Vere's. Was your father killed in battle? Tom asked, and Maud replied. No, sir. That is, he did not die in the battlefield. He was wounded and crawled away into the woods where they found him dead sitting against a tree with a little Union drummer boy lying right beside him and father's handkerchief bound round the poor bleeding stumps for the little hands were both shot away. I've thought of that boy so often, Maud said, and cried for him so much. I know father was kind to him for the little fellow was nestled close to him, Arthur said. He was there and found my father, though he did not at first recognize him, as it was a number of years since he had seen him. Tom was growing both interested and excited. He was beginning to find the key to that familiar look in Maud de Vere's face, and coming close to her, he said, Were any prisoners taken near your father, Miss de Vere? Union prisoners, I mean. Yes, Maud replied. Arthur was a private then and with another soldier was prowling through the woods when they came upon father and two union soldiers near him one a boy arthur said and one an officer whose ankle had been sprained in their eagerness to capture somebody they forgot my father and carried off the man and boy then they went back and arthur found by some papers in the dead soldier's pocket that it was father and he had him decently buried at manassas with the little boy i liked arthur for that I would never have forgiven him if he left that child in the woods. When the war is over, I am going to find the graves. She was not weeping now, but her eyes had in them a strange glitter as they looked far off in the distance, as if in quest of those two graves. Maud de Vere, Tom Carlton said, and at the sound Maud started and blushed scarlet. You must forgive me if I call you Maud this once. It's for the sake of your noble father, by whose side I stood when the spirit left his body, and went after that of the little drummer boy, whose bleeding stumps were bound in your father's handkerchief. I remember it well. I had sprained my ankle, and with a lad of my company was trying to escape, when I heard the sound of someone singing that glorious chant of our church, Peace on Earth, Good Will Toward Men. It sounded strangely there amid the dead and dying who had killed each other but there was peace between the confederate captain and the federal boy as they sang the familiar words as well as we could we cared for him i wiped the blood from your father's wound and the boy brought him water from the brook while he talked of his home in north carolina of his children who would never see him again and of nelly his wife it comes back to me with perfect distinctness and it is your father's look in your eyes and face which has puzzled me so much Two soldiers wearing the southern grey came up and captured us, and we were taken to Richmond. Surely, Miss de Vere, it is a special providence which has brought me at last to you, the daughter of that man, and made you the guardian angel who has stood between me and recapture. There is a meaning in it, if we could only find it. Tom's fine eyes were bent upon Maud, and in his excitement he had grasped her hand, which did not lie as cold and pulseless in his as an hour before it had lain in Arthur's. It throbbed and quivered now, but clung to Tom's with a firm hold which was not relaxed even when Arthur came up, his face growing dark and threatening as he saw the position of the two. Maud did not care for Arthur then, or think what that look in Tom's kindling eyes might mean. She only remembered that the man whose hand held hers so firmly had ministered to her dying father, had held the cup of water to his parched lip, had wiped the flowing blood from his face, and spoken to him kindly words of sympathy. Here was the answer to her prayer, that God would send her somebody who could tell her of her father's last minutes. 
that somebody had come and in her gratitude to him she could almost have knelt and worshipped him oh arthur she cried captain carleton is the very man you and joe newell captured at bull run he was with father when he died he took care of him and was so kind until you came and took him and ma's eyes flashed with anything but affection upon her lover who for a moment could not speak for his surprise curiously he looked at tom seeking for something on which to fasten a doubt for he did not wish maud to have a cause for gratitude to the northern officer but the longer he gazed the less he doubted the face of the lame officer in the virginia woods came up distinctly before him and was too much like the face confronting him to admit of a mistake especially after maud repeated the substance of what she had heard from captain carleton arthur was convinced and as maud dropped tom's hand he took it in his and said it is very strange that my first prize over whose capture i felt so proud should fall again into my power but this time you are safe i reckon i am older than i was three years ago and not quite so thirsty for a yankee's blood you did maud's father good service it seems and to prove that we rebels can be grateful and generous even to our foes i will take you under my protection as one of my party when i escort maud home to tennessee as i intend doing in a few days maud's face was white with passion as she listened to this patronizing speech which had in it so much of assumed superiority over the man who smiled a very peculiar kind of smile as he bowed his acknowledgment of arthur's kind attentions not a hint was there that maud was set in front of the arrangement that for tom's sake she had pledged herself to one whose inferiority never struck her so painfully as now when she saw him side by side with captain carleton arthur did not care to have captain carleton know how much he was indebted to maud for his present pleasant quarters and his prospect of a safe transfer to the hills of tennessee but tom though never suspecting the whole truth did know that his gratitude for past and present kindness received from that southern family was mainly due to maud whom he admired more and more as the days wore on and he learned to know her intimately the shy reserve which since his convalescence she had manifested toward him passed with the knowledge that he had stood by her dying father and she treated him as a friend with whom she had been acquainted all her life long occasionally as something in tom's manner made her think that but for arthur she might perhaps in time bear that relation toward him which mary williams had borne she felt a fierce throb of pain and a sense of such utter desolation that she involuntarily rebelled against the life before her but maud was a brave sensible girl she had chosen her lot she reasoned and she would abide by it and make arthur as happy as she could he was fulfilling his part of the contract well as was proven by the terror-stricken creature whom he had found hiding on the plantation and had brought to hetty's cabin where he now lay so weak that it was impossible to take him along on that journey to tennessee his time will come by and by arthur said when maud expressed anxiety for him i'll land him safely at your uncle paul some night when you least expect it my business now is with you and your yankee captain maud had asked that for the present nothing should be said with regard to their engagement and so though the judge suspected that some definite arrangement had been made between his son and maud he did not know for certain even when she stood before him attired for the journey the judge was sorry to part with maud and he was sorry to part with tom he liked him because he was a gentleman if he was a yankee and because his father had sent seth back poor seth with his free papers in his coffin and because he had been kind to maud's father and married mary williams of the charleston williamses and could smoke a cob pipe and enjoy it these were the things which recommended tom to the old man who shook his hand warmly at parting saying to him i hate northern dogs mostly but hanged if i don't like you may you get safely home and if you do my advice is to stay there and tell the rest of em to do the same they can't whip us no by george they can't even if they have got some advantage the papers say it was all a strategical trap and we'd rather you'd have the places than not you can't take richmond no sir we will die in the last ditch every mother's son of us and what is left will set the town on fire and let it go to thunder the old judge was waxing very eloquent for a man who had one union soldier recruiting in hetty's cabin and was bidding good-bye to another but consistency was no part of war politics and he rambled on until arthur cut him short by saying they could wait no longer 
with arthur as a safeguard in case of an attack from confederates and tom carleton in case of an assault from the unionists maud felt perfectly secure and in quiet and safety she accomplished her journey and was welcomed with open arms by paul haverhill and charlie arthur could only stop for a day among the hills he might be ordered back to his regiment at any time and if he got that other chap through he must bestir himself he said and so he bade good-bye to Maud, in whom he had implicit faith, and whose sober, quiet demeanour he tried to attribute to her sorrow at parting with him. "'She does like me some, and by and by she will like me better,' he said as he went his way, leaving her standing in the doorway of her uncle's house, her face very pale, and her hands pressed closely together as if forcing back some bitter thought or silent pain. Turning once ere the winding road hid her from view, Arthur kissed his hand to her gaily, while with a wave of her handkerchief she re-entered the house, and neither guessed nor dreamed how or when they would meet again. End of chapters 30 and 31chapters 32 and 33 of Rose Mather, a tale by Mary Jane Holmes this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 32. Suspicion Maud de Vere had insisted that Captain Carleton should have her room, inasmuch as he would be more secure there. For if the house was suspected and searched, a catastrophe Paul Haverhill was constantly anticipating, no one would be likely to invade the sanctity of her apartment. And Tom found it so very pleasant and quiet and homelike that he was not at all indisposed to linger for several days particularly after paul found an opportunity for sending the federal lines a letter which would tell the anxious friends in rockland of his safety this letter which was directed to mrs william mather had been the direct means of tom's ascertaining that his brother-in-law was not only alive but had once shared in the hospitalities now so freely extended to himself after learning this tom could not forbear tearing open the envelope and adding in a postscript i have just heard that will was not many weeks since a guest in this very house where i am so kindly cared for god bless the noble man who has saved so many lives and the beautiful girl his niece i cannot say enough in her praise i do believe she would die for a unionist any day will it seems did not see her as she was away when he was here and perhaps it is just as well for you little rose that he did not there is something in her eye and voice and carriage which stirs strange thoughts and feelings in the hearts of us savages who have so long been deprived of ladies' society she is a very queen among women that postscript was a most unlucky thought the first part of tom's letter had been so guarded with regard to the people who befriended him that no harm to them could possibly have accrued from its falling into hostile hands but in the postscript he forgot himself and assumed forms of speech which pointed directly to Paul Haverhill and his niece Maud de Vere. And so the guerrillas, who caught and half killed the refugee entrusted with the letter, set themselves at once at work to find the noble man who had the beautiful niece. It was not a difficult task, and Paul Haverhill, who had been looked upon as so rank a secessionist, was suddenly suspected of treason. Paul was popular and dangerous while Maud de Vere, whose principles were well known, was too much beloved by the rough mountaineers to allow of harm falling upon her at once. But the writer of that letter, the Yankee Carlton, should not go unpunished, and just at sunset one afternoon Lois, who had been at a neighboring cabin, came hurrying home with that ashen hue upon her dark face which is the negro's sign of paleness. "'Master Paul was suspicioned of harboring somebody,' she said and already the hordes of mountaineers were assembling around the crossroads and concerting measures for surprising and entrapping the yankee clo tell me she hear em say if they was perfectly sure about masser and it wasn't for miss maud they'd set the house on fire and they looks mighty like they's fit to do it the wust faces miss maud and they does swar awful bout the yankee they's got halters and tar and feathers and guns lois was out of breath by this time and even if she had not been she would have paused with wonder at the face of her young mistress maud had listened intently to the first part of lois's story but felt no emotion save that of scorn and contempt for the men assembled at the cross-roads and whom uncle paul could manage so easily but when it came to the halter for the yankee her face turned white as marble and in that moment of peril she realized all that captain carleton was to her 
and knew what had been the result of the last week's daily intercourse with one so gifted and so congenial she knew too that he was not for her arthur turnbridge stood in the way of that she would keep her faith with him but she would save captain carleton or die lois she said and there was no tremor in her voice bring that red dress i gave you last christmas the one you think is so long your shawl and bonnet too and shoes bring them to captain carleton's room lois comprehended her mistress at once and hurried away to her cabin after the dress whose extra length she had so often deplored saying it wasn't for such as her to wear switch and trains like the grand folks meanwhile maud had communicated with her uncle who manifested no concern except for his guest and even for him he had no fears provided he could reach the cave in safety to accomplish that was maud's object and as the cross-roads lay in that direction a great amount of tact and skill was necessary but maud was equal to any emergency and half an hour later there issued from paul haverell's door two figures clad in female garments and whom a casual observer would have sworn were maud de vere and her servant lois maud had a revolver in her pocket and another in the basket she carried so carefully and which was supposed to contain the cups of jelly and custard she was taking a poor sick neighbour whose house was up the mountain path at her side with the shuffling gait peculiar to lois tom carleton walked his nicely blackened face hidden in the deep shaker which lois had worn for years and his calico dress flopping awkwardly about his feet lois fortunately was very tall and so her skirts did good service for the young man whose powers of imitation were perfect and who walked and looked exactly like the old coloured woman watching his progress from an upper window and declaring that she would almost swear it was herself at her side stood charlie a round spot of red burning on either pale cheek and his slender hands grasping a revolver while occasionally his blue eyes looked eagerly along the mountain road which as yet was quiet and lonely i never thought to raise my hand against my own people he said but if they harm uncle paul i shall shoot somebody the sun had been gone from sight for some little time and the tall mountain shadows were lying thick and black across the valley when up the road several horsemen came galloping and paul haverell's house was ere long surrounded by a band of as rough savage-looking men as could well be found in the mountains of tennessee calmly and fearlessly paul haverell went out to meet them asking why they were there and why they seemed so much excited for a moment his old power over them asserted itself again and they hesitated to charge him with treason as they intended doing but only for a brief space was there a calm and then amid oaths and imprecations and taunting sneers and threats they told him of the letter and deriding him as a traitor demanded the sneaking yankee who had written that letter and was now hidden in the house to reason with such people was useless and paul haverell did not try it standing upon his doorstep with his grey hair blowing in the evening wind and his hands deep in his pockets he said i admit your charge in part there has been a union soldier in my house an escaped prisoner from columbia i did care for him and i am neither ashamed nor afraid to own it fear is a stranger to old paul haverell as any of you who tries to harm him will find never mind a speech paul said the leader of the men nobody wants to hurt you though you deserve hanging perhaps what we want is the yankee fetch him out and let's see how he'll look dangling in the air yes fetch him out yelled a dozen voices in chorus bring out the yankee we want him hello puny face are you a bad egg too they continued as charlie appeared in the door shall i fire uncle paul charlie asked and his uncle replied by no means unless you would have them on us like wolves friends and he turned to the mob which had been increased by some twenty or more friends that man is gone he is not here he has left my house you can search it if you like where is miss de vere a coarse voice cried we know her to be union she never tried to cover that as you hoary old villain did she was out and out let her come and say the yankee is gone and we will believe her my niece i regret to say is not just now in either she is gone with lois to take some knick-knacks to a sick neighbour that's so boys i met her myself as i came down the mountain called out a young man of the company who seemed to be superior to his associates gone with lois eh then whose woolly pate is that 
responded a drunken brute who rising in his stirrups fired a shot toward the garret window from which lois in an unguarded moment had thrust her head others had seen her too and as this gave the lie to the story that lois was gone the maddened crowd pressed against the house declaring their intention to search it and hang any runaway they might find secreted there it never occurred to them that the runaway could have been with maud in lois's clothes but the young man who met the two lone women saw the ruse at once and influenced by maud's beauty and the remembrance of the sweet good evening mark with which she had greeted him as he passed he made his way to charlie's side and whispered if you know where your sister has gone and can warn her do so at once tell her if she is tolerably safe to stay there and not return here to-night charlie needed no second bidding and stealing from the rear of the house he was soon speeding up the mountain path in the direction of the cave meanwhile the search in paul haverell's house went on closets were thrown open beds were torn to pieces cellars were ransacked and old lois was dragged from the ash house where she had taken refuge while worse than all tom carleton's boots were found in the chamber where he had dressed so hurriedly and the sight of these maddened the excited crowd which failing of finding their victim began to clamour for paul haverell's blood but paul kept them at bay in the rear of the house was a small dark room to which there was but one entrance and that a steep narrow stairway here paul haverell took refuge and standing at the head of the stairs threatened to shoot the first man who should attempt to come up they had not yet reached that state when they counted their lives as nothing and so amid yells and oaths and riding up and down the road and drinking the fine grape wines with which the cellar was stocked the hours of the short summer night wore on until just as the dawn was breaking in the east the marauders put the finishing touch to their night's debauch by setting fire to the house and then starting in a body up the mountainside in the direction of the cave thirty three in the cave the cave was dry and comparatively comfortable and tom felt as he entered it almost like going home will mather had spent a day and a night there while better than all maud de vere was with him her bright eyes shining upon him through the darkness and her hands touching his as she groped around for the candle her uncle had said was on the shelf in the rock it was presently found and with the aid of the match maud had brought with her a light was soon struck its flickering beams lighting up the dark recesses of the cavern with a ghastly kind of light which to maud seemed more terrible than the darkness she was not afraid but her nerves were shaken as only threatened danger to tom carleton could shake them and she felt strangely alone on the wild mountain-side and in that silent cavern tom did not seem like much of a protector in that woman's garb but when with a shake and a kick and a merry laugh he threw aside the bonnet shawl and dress and stood before her in his own proper person minus the boots she felt all her courage coming back and with him beside her would have defied the entire southern army there was water enough in the spring to wash the black from his face and maud lent her own pretty ruffled white apron for a towel and then when his toilet was completed began to speak of returning at this hour and alone with the road full of robbers never maud never you must either stay here with me or i shall go back with you tom said and he involuntarily wound his arm around the waist of the young girl who trembled like a leaf she did not think of arthur then or her promise to him for something in tom's voice and manner as he put his arm about her and called her maud brought to her a feeling such as she had never experienced before perhaps tom suspected that he was understood for he held her closer to him and passing his hand caressingly over her burning cheek he whispered dear maud i cannot let you incur any danger which i must not share you understand me don't you she thought of arthur then and the thought cut like a knife through her heart she must not understand she must not listen to words like these she must not stay there to hear them and with a quick gesture she was removing tom's arm from her waist when his wary hiss made her pause and stand where she was leaning against him and heavily too as terror overcame every other feeling footsteps were coming near and coming cautiously too up to the very entrance of the cave where they stopped as some one outside seemed to be listening it was a moment of terrible suspense and maud could hear the throbbing of her heart while tom strained her so close to him that his chin rested on her hair and she felt his breath upon her cheek maud sister maud came reassuringly in a low whisper and with a cry maud burst away from tom exclaiming charlie what brings you here 
he explained to her why he was there and that she must stay all night and with a shudder as she thought of what might befall her uncle maud acquiesced in the decree feeling glad that charlie was with them a hindrance and preventive to the utterance of words she must not hear a hindrance he was it is true but not a total preventive for by and by the tired boy's eyes began to droop as drowsiness stole over him and when tom made him a bed with lois's dress and shawl and bade him lie down and sleep he did so at once after first offering the impromptu couch to maud seen by the dim candlelight maud's face was very white and her eyes shone like burning coals as she watched captain carleton and guessed his motive had there been no arthur in the way she would not have shrunk from captain carleton but with that haunting memory she could have shrieked aloud when she saw the weary lids droop over charlie's eyes and knew by his regular breathing that he was asleep tom knew it as soon as she did but for a time he kept silence then he came close to her and sitting down by her side said softly maud you and i have been very strangely thrown together and as i once said to you there is a meaning in it if we will but find it shall i try and solve it for you or do you know yourself what is in my mind she did know but she could not answer and her face drooped over her brother whose head she had pillowed upon her lap perhaps this is not the fitting place for me to speak tom continued but if the morning finds me in safety i must be gone and no one can guess when we may meet again let me tell you maud of my early life before ever i saw or dreamed of you surely she might hear this and the bowed head lifted itself a little while captain carleton told first of his home in boston of beautiful little rose and saucy dark-eyed jimmy and then of the pale proud mary his early manhood's love who at the last had lost the pride and hauteur inherited from her race and had died so gentle and lowly and gone where her husband one day hoped to meet her then there came a pause and tom was thinking of a night when poor jimmy sat by his side before the lonely tent fire and talked with him of annie graham should he tell maud of that yes he would and by the even beating of his heart as he made that resolve and thought of annie he knew he had outlived his fancy for one of whom he spoke unhesitatingly praising her girlish beauty telling how pure and good she was and how once a hope had stirred his heart that he perhaps might win her but i gave her up to jimmy annie will be my sister and i know now why it was so appointed god had in store for me a gem as beautiful as annie graham and better adapted to me i mean you maud god intends you for my wife do you accede willingly have you any love for the poor yankee soldier who has been so long dependent upon you he had her head now on his arm and with his hand was smoothing her bands of satin hair while he waited for her to speak he had dealt honestly with her she would be equally truthful with him and she answered at last oh mr carleton you don't know how much it pains me to tell you what i must i might have loved you once but now it is too late i promised arthur if he would be kind to the poor prisoners and help the escaped ones to get away and oh i don't know what but i am to be his wife when the dreadful war is over pity me mr carleton but don't love me no no don't make me more wretched by telling me of a love i cannot return could you return it maud if there were no promise to arthur tom spoke very low with his lips close to her burning cheek but maud did not reply and tom continued maud was the getting me here in safety any part of the price for which you sold yourself she did not answer even then but by the low gasping sob she gave as she shed back from her hot brow the heavy hair tom knew the truth and to himself he said it shall not be and then from his heart there went up a silent prayer that god would give him the brave beautiful girl who drew herself away from him and leaning over her sleeping brother sat with both hands clasped upon her face they did not talk together much more and once tom thought maud was asleep she sat so rigid and motionless with her face turned toward the entrance of the cave but she was not asleep and her dark eyes were fixed wistfully upon the one bright star visible to her and which seemed whispering to her of hope perhaps arthur would release her from her promise and perhaps but maud started from that thought as from an evil spirit and her white lips whispered faintly god help me to keep my promise the night was very still and as the hours wore on and the faint dawn of day came over the mountain tops 
Maud's quick ear caught the echo of the fierce shouts in the valley below, and laying Charlie's head from her lap, she went out of the cave, followed by Captain Carleton, who wondered to see how that one night had changed her. The brilliant color was gone from her cheek, which looked haggard and pale, as faces look when some great storm of sorrow has passed over them. Her hair had fallen down and lay in masses upon her neck, from which she shook it off impatiently, and then intently listened to the sounds which each moment grew louder. Shoutings they were, and tones of command, mingled with the distant tramp of horses' feet, while suddenly above the tall treetops which skirted the mountainside arose a coil of smoke. Too dark, too thick to have come from any chimney where the early morning fire was kindled, it told its own tale of horror, and Maud's eyes grew so black and fierce that Tom shrunk back from her, as, pointing her finger toward the fast-increasing rings of smoke and flame, she whispered, "'Do you see that, Captain Carleton? It's Uncle Paul's dwelling. They have set it on fire. I never thought they would do that, though I have watched more than one burning house in these mountains, and have almost felt a thrill of pride as I thought how dearly we are paying for our love to the old flag. But when it comes to my own home, the pride is all gone, the fire burns deeper, and one is half tempted to question the price required for the union. Tom was about to speak to her when she turned abruptly upon him and said, Captain Carleton, do you believe your northern women, your Rose, your Annie, would bear and brave what the loyal women of the South endure? They may be true to the Union, no doubt they are, and they think they know what war means. But I tell you they do not. Did they ever see their friends and neighbors driven to the woods and hills like hunted beasts, or watch the kindling flames devouring their own houses as I am doing now? For I know that is my Uncle Paul's and whether he still lives or is hung between the earth and heavens god only knows and perhaps he has forgotten i sometimes think he has else why does he not send us aid where are your hordes of men why do they not come to save us when we have waited so long and our eyes and ears are weak and weary with watching for their coming she was talking now more to herself than to her companion, and she looked a very queen of tragedy as, with her hair floating over her shoulders, and her hands pressed tightly together, she walked hurriedly the length and breadth of the long flat rock which bordered a precipice near the cave. Tom was about to answer her, when a ball went whizzing past him, while the loud shouts of the men whose heads were visible beneath the distant trees told that he had been discovered. To return to the cave and take Maud with him was the work of a moment, and amid yells of fury the drunken mob came on to where Maud, forgetting everything now except Tom Carleton, stood waiting for them. They would not harm her, she knew, and like a lioness guarding its young, she stood within the cave, but so near the entrance that her face was visible to the men, who at sight of her stopped suddenly and asked what she was doing there and who she had with her. My brother Charlie and Captain Carleton, the man whom you sought at Uncle Paul's, she answered fearlessly as she held with a firm grasp the dangerous-looking weapon which she knew how to use and pray what may you be doing with the yankee asked one of the coarser of the men and maud replied i am standing between him and just such creatures as you are while tom grasping her shoulder said step aside maud i cannot endure this you a girl defending me i must go out let me pass to certain death never maud replied thrusting him back with a strength born of desperation charlie who had roused from his sleep and fully comprehended what was going on caught tom around the neck and nearly strangled him as he said let maud alone captain carleton they'll not harm her they would only shoot you down for nothing thus hampered and importuned tom stood back a little while maud held a parley with her besiegers threatening to shoot the first man who should attempt to pass her she did not think of danger to herself and she stood firmly at her post while the men consulted together as to the best course to be pursued and while they talked and maud stood watchful and dauntless the flames of paul haverell's house rose higher in the heavens and strange ominous sounds were heard in the distance sounds as of many horsemen riding for dear life with shouts and excited voices and maud became aware of some sudden influence working upon the crowd around her then a band of cavalry dashed into sight and all was wild hurry and consternation but above the din of the strife without tom carleton caught sounds which made his heart leap up and springing forward past maud de vere he exclaimed thank god the federals have come we are saved maud we are saved 
as his tall form emerged into view a brutal soldier maddened by the surprise and unavoidable defeat levelled his gun and fired recking little whether tom or maud was the victim the ball cut through the sleeve of maud's dress and grazing her arm enough to draw blood lodged harmlessly in the rocks beyond at that sight all charlie's fire was roused and the shot which went whizzing through the air made surer work than did the one intended for tom carleton tom was out upon the ledge of rocks by this time grasping the hands of the bluecoats who were a part of a company sent out to reconnoitre and who had reached paul haverell's house just after the rebels had left it at first they had tried to extinguish the flames but finding that impossible they had followed the enemy most of whom were made prisoners of war some months before john sims had been transferred from the army of the potomac to the army of the cumberland and he it was who led his men to the rescue doing it the more daringly and willingly when he heard who was in danger he was a captain now and he stood grasping tom carleton's hand when a piercing shriek rose on the air and turning round the young men saw maud de vere bending over the prostrate form of a soldier whose head she gently lifted up as she moaned bitterly oh arthur arthur how came you here End of chapters 32 and 33chapters thirty four through thirty six of rose mather a tale by mary jane holmes this librivox recording is in the public domain thirty four poor arthur he had kept his word and piloted safely across the mountains the prisoner left in hetty's cabin his arrival at paul haverell's burning home had preceded that of the federal troops by twenty minutes or more and when he heard of maud's danger he followed our soldiers up the hillside to where maud held the entrance to the cave he saw her and tried to make his voice heard but it was lost amid the strife and noise of the conflict and she only knew of his presence when charlie with chattering teeth and a face as white as ashes clutched her dress frantically and said come sister come this way to arthur somebody shot him do you think he will die quick as lightning the remembrance of the thought which had yet scarcely been a thought of just such a contingency as this flashed over maud sweeping away all the pain the terror the shrinking she had felt when she contemplated the fulfilment of her promise to arthur turnbridge he was lying there at her feet and the grass beneath him was all a pool of blood while his dim eyes showed that the objects around him were now but faintly discerned he saw maud though and when her loud cry met his ear he smiled a glad grateful smile and said to her as she knelt beside him and took his head in her lap you are sorry maud it was a mistake you did love me some she pressed her quivering lips to his and said again oh arthur arthur how came you here arthur knew he was dying but shaking off all thought of his own pain he explained to maud how he came there the man you remember i got him through and i am not sorry for he told me of a blind mother and six little children dependent upon him away off somewhere among the ohio hills think if they had been left without support i am glad i saved him even if it cost my life and still it is hard to die maud just as you are beginning to love me for you are and if i had lived you would have kept your promise to me yes arthur i would and maud's white fingers threaded the bloody hair and moved softly over the ghastly face who did it arthur she asked and arthur's face flushed to a purple hue as with a moan he said don't ask me there was a mistake i had taken no part in the fray except to knock down the ruffian who fired at you i was standing right behind him yes there was a mistake oh maud it was a mistake he kept repeating the words while maud tried to stop the blood flowing so freely from the wound in his temple the ball had entered there but had not penetrated to the brain and he retained his consciousness to the last smiling once kindly on charlie who half frantic bent over him and said yes arthur it was a mistake oh arthur oh maud and you two were engaged i did not know it before then a bright flush crept into maud's white face for she knew the tall shadow on the grass beside her belonged to captain carleton and he she guessed was thinking of last night in the cave he did think of it but only for a moment and then his thoughts were merged in his great anxiety for lieutenant arthur who he saw was dying arthur knew he was there and smiled when he asked if he felt much pain none with maud beside me 
she was to have been my wife weren't you maud yes arthur i was to have been your wife she spoke it openly frankly as if by doing so she was seeking to atone for an error and the eyes lifted to tom's face had in them something defiant as if she would say i mean it i would have been his wife but she met only pity in tom's looks pity for her and pity for the young man dying among the mountains on that soft summer morning when the whole world seemed so at variance with a death like that it was a strange scene and one which those who witnessed it never could forget the broad level plat on the mountain side the mounted horsemen the group of prisoners the beautiful queenly girl whose lap pillowed the head of the dying soldier while her brilliant eyes wept floods of tears which with quick nervous movements of her fingers she swept away beside her was charlie his face whiter than that of the dying man and his muscles working painfully as if he was forcing back some terrible pang or cry of agony tom carleton too and paul haverill who had later joined the group and stood looking sadly on while toward the south the smoke and flame of his own house was ascending and in the east the early morning was bright and fresh with the summer's golden sunshine and there on the mountain-side they waited and watched while the young lieutenant talked faintly of his distant home where the news would carry so much sorrow tell father i died believing in our cause and were i to live my life over i should join the southern army but it's wrong about the prisoners we ought not to abuse those who fall into our hands i've loved you maud for so long remember me when i am gone not for anything brilliant there was about me but because i loved you so well and died in carrying out the work you gave me to do oh arthur arthur speak some word of comfort to me or i shall surely die it was a mistake charlie whispered as he crept close to arthur's side the dying man's eyes rested inquiringly for a moment in charlie's face then lighted up with a sudden joy charlie charlie come close he whispered bend your ear to my lips maud must not hear me his head was still lying on maud's lap but he spoke so low to charlie that she did not hear the question asked she only knew that charlie started quickly and throwing one arm across her neck as if to save her from some evil said promptly energetically no no arthur no then the quivering lips went down again to arthur's ear and maud caught the word mistake and that was all she did not know or think what it really meant it was all a mistake the terrible war which had brought her so much pain and suffering i die easier now it was so horrible before poor charlie don't let it trouble you care for maud she would have been my wife stick to our cause you never forsook it came faintly from arthur and his eyes when again they rested on maud's face had lost the strange frightened look which she had observed when she first came to his side he was dying very fast and his mind seemed groping for some form of prayer with which to meet the last great foe pray somebody he moaned and paul haverill who wholly overcome with all he had passed through during the last few hours had stood dumb and motionless replied in a choking voice i am not a praying man but god be with you my boy and land you safely on t'other side where there's no more fighting yes but that isn't our father i used to say it at home came feebly from the white lips and then tom carleton knelt beside the youth whose path had crossed his so often and so strangely and with deep reverence and earnest entreaty commended the departing spirit to the god who deals more gently and mercifully and lovingly with his children than they dealt with each other tom thought of isaac sims and the noisome filthy room in libby where he had first learned to pray and the thought gave fervour to his prayer to which arthur listened intently his lips motioning the amen he could not speak for he had no power of utterance once again they moved with a pleading kind of motion and maud stooped over to kiss them her long hair falling across the pallid brow where the blood-stains were and when she lifted her head up and pushed back her heavy locks there was the seal of death on arthur's face thirty five the dead and the living of all paul haverill's comfortable buildings house stables barn and negro quarters there was left him only one cabin which the fire had not consumed that stood a little distant from the rest and had been occupied by lois before her husband died 
it was superior to the other cabins then it was neat and tidy now and where they laid the dead lieutenant in his grey uniform with a little flag of stars and bars across his breast this was charlie's thought and it was very meet that he to the last had believed in the righteousness of the confederacy should have her sign above him there was no other spot except the cabin where maud could stay and the entire day and night she sat by her dead arthur whom now that he was dead she cherished in her heart as a martyr and a hero questioning even the ground on which she had hitherto stood so firmly and asking herself if after all the south was so very far out of the way or if the union were worth the fearful price the southern people were paying for it maud did not know herself in this mood it was so unlike all her former theories and more than once she pressed her hot hands to her still hotter head and asked if she was going mad crouched beside maud with his blue eyes fixed upon her with a pitying remorseful look was charlie poor maud poor sister i am so sorry i never thought i did not know you used to laugh about him so to uncle paul i'd give my life to bring him back for you did you love him so very much charlie said in broken sentences and then maud shivered from head to foot but made him no reply she had not loved him so very much but his violent death and all the horrors attending it had shaken her terribly and could he have come back to life she would have tried to love him and with her iron will would have crushed that other love the very knowledge of which had made her heart throb with so much joy but the dead come not to life again and the next morning they buried arthur turnbridge in the grassy enclosure where paul haverell's wife was sleeping with the infant son who had he lived would have been just arthur's age the blue-coated soldiery who had been his deadly foes paid him every military honour possible within their means even marching to his grave behind the stars and bars which lay upon his coffin but when they came back from the burial they bore the national flag whose folds that peaceful summer night floated in the breeze from the top of lois's cabin very kind and gentle and pitiful was tom's demeanour toward maud during the day and the night when she had sat by arthur in lois's cabin he had not been near her but after all was over he went to her and with the authority of a friend and brother insisted that she should take the rest she needed so much and maud gave way at the sound of his soothing quieting voice and with a flood of tears did what he bade her do and then tom sat by her and bathed her throbbing head and smoothed her beautiful hair and paid back in part the services she had rendered him when he lay sick in squire turnbridge's house maud was not ill only exhausted both physically and mentally the exhaustion showing itself in the quiet listless state into which she lapsed paying but little attention to what was passing around her and offering no suggestion or remonstrance when told of her uncle's plan to accompany captain sims and his men to knoxville over paul haverell too a change had passed the attack upon him by his old friends and neighbours though long expected had been sudden and terrible when it came and as he watched the burning of the house which had been his so long he felt that every tie which bound him to the old place was severed then came swiftly the fearful tragedy of the mountains when arthur was brought to him dead stunned and bewildered by the startling events which had followed each other so rapidly paul was hardly able to counsel for himself and assented readily to the plan which had really originated with captain carleton who had another scheme underlying that but who suggested both so skilfully that paul haverell fancied they were his own ideas and gave them as such to maud they would go to knoxville with the soldiers he said thence to nashville they had some relatives living there and after resting for a little they would continue their journeyings north going perhaps as far as new york i always wanted to travel north he said but my affairs kept me at home now i have no affairs my neighbours have relieved me of such commodities and i want to get away from a spot where i have witnessed such dreadful things we all need change you maud more than i and charlie more than either i don't know what has come over the boy that horrible night and morning were too much for him maud knew that so far as charlie was concerned her uncle had spoken truly charlie was greatly changed and his eyes had in them a scared look as if every detail of the horrors of the fight on the mountain had stamped itself indelibly upon his mind and was never for an instant forgotten he needed a change of place and scene and as she could not return to arthur's desolate home whither the sad news had been sent at once maud assented to the nashville arrangement and in three weeks was comfortably settled at a nashville hotel with lois as her attendant 
her uncle charley and captain carleton were with her the latter constantly putting off his journey to rockland where they were so anxiously waiting for him he had written to rose immediately after his arrival at nashville telling her of all that had transpired and speaking of maude de vere as one whom he hoped to make his wife this time the letter went safely and rose replied at once urging tom to come home and insisting that mr haverill maude and charley should accompany him they saved will's life as well as yours rose wrote i have a right to them all and especially to the noble maude bring her to me tom and let me coax back the colour to her dear face and the brightness to her eyes i shall come myself and get her if she refuses maude had never known the companionship of a sister had never had a single intimate girlfriend except nettie turnbridge who died independent strong-willed and self-reliant she had cared but little for any society except that which she found with nature in the wild mountains of tennessee but now broken and shocked and shorn of some of her strength she longed for sympathy and companionship and something in rose mather's sprightly letter made her heart yearn toward the little lady who had written it and the pleasant home which rose described as beautiful with the summer bloom i will think about it by and by she said to her uncle but for the present it is nice to rest here in nashville so for a time longer they lingered in tennessee while rose waited impatiently for them and fretted at the delay thirty four andersonville prisoners this seems to be one of the worst cases we have had i doubt if his mind will survive the horrors he has endured even if his body does poor fellow his mother would not recognize him now this was what the physician at annapolis said to mrs sims of a miserable emaciated skeleton which had come up from andersonville with the last arrival of prisoners while we in the mountains of tennessee were tracing the wanderings of will mather and captain carleton mrs sims and annie had stood untiringly at their posts beside the sick and dying soldiers who had learned to bless and watch for the stern widow and to love and worship the beautiful annie graham and well had she earned such appreciation for she had been most faithful to the wretched ones committed to her care faithful both to body and soul and in the better world she knew there was waiting to welcome her more than one whose darkened mind she had led to the fountain of all light and annie had made a vow to stay till from that foul southern prison where twenty-eight thousand men had died there came to her the one for whom she always looked so anxiously when new arrivals came her blue eyes running rapidly over each wasted form and then filling with tears when their scrutiny was found to be in vain james carleton had never been heard from since that letter sent to her so long ago and hope had died out of annie's heart when at last with widow sims she stood by the cot where lay the insensible form of which the physician had spoken so discouragingly it was the figure of a young man who must once have been finely formed with a handsome face and hair and eyes the latter were closed now and only the lids moved with a convulsive motion as annie bent over him the dark hair matted and coarse and filthy had curled in rings about the bony forehead but had been cut away when the bath was given and the closely shorn head was like many other heads which annie graham's hands had touched gently tenderly as they now moved over this one trying to infuse some life into the breathing skeleton he was to be her charge he was in her division and mrs sim's keen gray eyes scanned annie curiously as she bent over the poor fellow he was helpless as an infant and annie nursed him much as she would have nursed a baby whose life hung on a thread he had been there four days and only a faint moaning sound had given token of life or consciousness but at the close of the fourth day as annie sat chafing the pulseless fingers where the gray skin hung so loosely the eyes opened for a moment and were fixed upon her face there was no consciousness in them no recognition of her presence nothing but the strained hungry despairing look annie had seen in the eyes of so many of our prisoners and which to a greater or less degree was peculiar to them all annie saw this look and then underneath it all she saw something more what it was she could not tell but it brought back to her those moonlight nights upon the beach at new london and that other night of more recent date when she sat with jimmy carleton beneath the rockland sky and heard his passionate words of love and saw his soft black eyes kindle with earnestness and then grow sad and sorrowful with disappointment there was no kindling in them now no ardent passion or heat of love but a certain softness and brightness and even sauciness lingered still and told annie at last who it was oh merciful father it is jimmy she said 
and unmindful of any who might be looking on she bent down and kissed the sunken cheeks from which the flesh was gone she had expected him so long and grown so weary and hopeless with expectations unfulfilled that she could scarcely believe it now or realize that the half-dead wretch before her was once the lively humorous teasing jimmy carleton how she pitied him and how her heart throbbed as she thought of the suffering he must have endured ere he reached this state of apparent imbecility then as she remembered what the physician said about his mind she dropped upon her knees and clasping her hands over her face prayed earnestly that god would remove the darkness and wholly restore the man whom she loved so dearly do you think he will die she asked mrs sims who had come for a moment to her side you know him then i was wondering that an old woman like me should see clearer than you i mistrusted from the first mrs sims answered and then to annie's eager question she replied it will be almost a miracle if we do get any sense into that brain or flesh upon these bones but we'll do the best we can her words were not very encouraging and annie's tears fell like rain upon the face of the man who gave no sign that he knew where he was or who was bending over him oh how he had longed for the air of the north as his face daily grew thinner greyer and more corpse-like while his flesh seemed shrivelling and drying on his bones bill baker had done what he could to ameliorate his condition done too much in fact and as the result he suddenly found himself shorn of his privileges and an inmate again of that dreadful prison even then he clung to and cared for jimmy until the pangs of starvation and the pains of sickness made him forgetful of all but himself and there they pined and wept and waited until the day of their release when bill was too ill to be removed and was left in charge of a humane family who kindly promised to care for him until he was better from a rockland soldier who had been taken prisoner at the battle of the wilderness jimmy had heard that mrs graham was at annapolis and then oh how he longed for the time when it might be his fate to be tended and nursed by her she would do it so gently and so kindly and in his dreams the walls of his pestilential prison stretched away to the green fields of the north where he walked again with annie and felt the clasp of her little hand and the light of her blue eyes she was always present with him she or the little lulu of pequot memory somehow these two were strangely mixed and when his mind began to totter as the physical strain on it became too great the two faces were united in one body and both bent lovingly over him just as annie graham was doing now when he was past knowing or caring who ministered to him a vague suspicion he had at intervals that in some respects there was a change that his bed was not the filthy sandbank nor his covering the pitiless sky gradually too there came a different look upon his face the colour was changing from the dingy grey to a more lifelike hue flesh was showing a little beneath the skin and the dark hair began to grow and annie watered the tiny curls with bitter tears for as proof of the terrible life whose horrors will never half be written the once black hair was coming out streaked with grey they knew in rockland that he was at annapolis but annie had peremptorily forbidden either mrs carleton or rose to come they could do no good she wrote jimmy would not know them and they might be in the way they were constantly expecting tom from tennessee with maud de vere and her friends and so they remained at home the more willingly and joining it upon annie to write them every day just a line to tell how jimmy was the summer rain was falling softly upon the streets of annapolis and the cool evening air came stealing into the room where annie graham sat by her patient there were not so many now in her ward and she had more time for jimmy by whose bedside every leisure moment was passed she was sitting by him now watching him as he slept and listening breathlessly to his low murmurings as he seemed to be talking of her and the dreadful prison life then he slept more soundly and she arranged the light so that it left his face in shadow but fell full upon her own half an hour passed in this way and annie's head was beginning to droop from languor and drowsiness when a sudden exclamation startled her and she looked up to see her patient's eyes fixed upon her while with his finger he pointed to the window opposite and whispered the star is risen again when i thought it had set for ever i take it as a good omen bill i shall see her face again did he think himself in prison still with that star shining over him and did he take her for bill baker 
the thought was not a very complimentary one but annie forgot everything in her joy at this evidence of returning reason jimmy she said softly and she bent her face so close to his that her lips touched his forehead jimmy don't you know that you are in annapolis with me with annie graham you remember annie she had many a time said these very words in his ear hoping somehow to impress them upon him and now she had succeeded for he repeated them after her slowly and with long pauses like a schoolboy trying to say a half-learned lesson jimmy don't you know that you are here in annapolis with me with annie graham you remember annie and as he said them consciousness began to struggle back the black eyes fastened themselves upon annie with a wistful look then they took in her dress her hands folded in her lap the decent covering on the bed the furniture of the room and then throwing up his arms he felt of his flesh and examined his linen and patted the pillow while still the look of wonder and perplexity deepened on his face suddenly he let his arms drop helplessly then stretched them feebly towards annie and while both chin and lip quivered touchingly and the tears streamed from his eyes he whispered clean face clean hands soft pillow and bed with the hunger and thirst and homesickness gone this is yes this must be god's land and she is there with me he fainted then the shock of coming back to god's land had been too great and for a week or more he paid but little heed to what was passing around him don't you know me jimmy it's i it's annie mrs graham would say to him as his restless eyes turned upon her and he would repeat after her don't you know me jimmy it's i it's annie this was a peculiarity of his and it continued until bill baker who had become strong enough to be moved came to annapolis and asked to see the corporal at first the physician refused but annie approved the plan hoping for a good result and she waited anxiously while bill said cheerily hello old corporal rather nice quarters here than that sandbank down by that infernal nasty stream bill baker's voice was the last which in the far-off prison had sounded kindly in jimmy's ears and now as he heard it again his face lighted up and his eyes kindled with something like their olden fire you know me corporal i'm bill we've been exchanged we're up to annapolis and miss graham is nussin you bill continued and then jimmy drew a long breath and burst into a passionate fit of tears they'll do him good they allus did to anderson bill he'd hold in till he was fit to burst and then he'd let him slide and feel better he'll know you miss graham after this annie was called away just then to attend to another patient and bill was left alone with jimmy there were a few broken sentences from the latter and then bill baker was heard talking rapidly but very gently and cautiously and jimmy lifted his head once and looked across the room where annie was better leave him alone a spell till he thinks it out and gets it arranged bill said to annie i made him understand where he was and that you was here and all right on the main question and though he'd like to have bust his biler for a minute he'll come all straight i reckon it was more than an hour before annie went to jimmy again but when she did the eager joyful look in his eyes told her that she was recognized don't speak to me don't talk she said laying one hand lightly upon the lips which began to move while with the other she smoothed the short curls of hair he kissed the hand upon his lips and whispered through the fingers tell me first was it true he told me do you he did not finish the sentence for annie understood him and bending so near to him that no one else could hear she said yes jimmy i do he seemed satisfied and something of his old manner came back to him when later in the day annie tried to straighten the clothes about him and wet and brushed his hair look like a hippopotamus don't i he asked touching his thick-skinned face not half as much as you did annie replied and the first smile her face had worn for weeks glimmered around her lips for she knew now the danger was past and jimmy carleton would live End of chapters thirty four through thirty six
Chapters thirty seven and thirty eight of Rose Mather, a tale by Mary Jane Holmes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Thirty seven in Rockland. The warm, bright November day was wearing to its close. The purple haze of the Indian summer lay around the hilltops, and the soft golden sunlight fell softly upon the grass and the few autumnal flowers which had escaped the recent storm the grounds around the mather mansion were looking almost as beautiful as in the early summer for the grass invigorated by the rain was fresh and green again and the brilliant foliage of the trees which dotted the lawn made up for the loss of the flowers even these last were not lacking indoors for the hothouse had been robbed of its costliest flowers which filled the whole house with perfume and made maud de vere start with surprise when she first entered the parlours it takes me back to my southern home she said to rose who standing on tiptoe fastened a half-open lily in her hair going into ecstasies over the effect and thinking to herself that maud de vere was the most regal creature she had ever seen maud had been in rockland three weeks and rose was already as much in love with her as if she had known her all her life at first she had dreaded a little to meet the fearless heroine of the mountains a girl who had held a revolver at the heads of both federal and confederate who in the night had ridden twenty miles on horseback to conduct a party of refugees to a place of safety and had guarded the entrance of the cave in the face of a furious mob must be something very formidable or at least something unlike all rose's ideas of what a lady gently born should be and both rose and her mother had waited nervously for the arrival of one who they felt sure was to be the wife of tom nothing definite had been said upon the subject since arthur died but it was tacitly understood by all parties that maud de vere was some time to be maud carleton and tom was allowed to pay her attentions which could only be paid to his fiancée in a great flutter of spirits rose had heard of maud's arrival at the monter house and immediately after dinner had driven down to see her accompanied by will who if possible was more anxious than herself to pay his respects to maud she was kneeling by charlie's couch when the party entered but she rose at once and came forward with the most beautiful carnation staining her cheeks and a look of modesty in her brilliant eyes she wore a long trailing dress of heavy silk and stood so erect and held her head so high that she seemed taller than she really was taller than tom rose feared but as he stepped up to her she saw he had the advantage of her by at least four inches and thus reassured she drew a long breath of relief then as thoughts of all her husband and brother had been saved from by this heroic girl came over her she sprang toward maud and winding her arms around her neck sobbed hysterically but never spoke one word what is it what are you crying for maud asked petting her as if she had been a little child oh i don't know the sight of you who have done so much for the war and been so brave makes me seem so little so small so mean beside you maud de vere rose replied brokenly and then maud's eyes filled with tears and she hugged the sobbing little creature whom from that moment she loved so fondly she too had dreaded this meeting for she knew that rose mather and her mother were both women of the highest culture and she felt that they might criticize and perhaps condemn one who had lived so long among the pines of north carolina and the mountains of tennessee but rose's manner divested her of all fear and in a moment she resumed that unconscious air of superiority to all else around her which was part of herself queenly was the word which best suited her looks and her manners and rose paid homage to her as to a queen and told her that she loved her and how much she had thought of her and how anxious her mother was to see her and how happy they would all be when jimmy and annie came home there had been daily visits to the monteur since then and mrs carleton had met the beautiful maud and mentally approved of tom's choice charlie too had been petted and caressed and his blue eyes opened with wonder as he saw what northern women were like and remembered his prejudice against them he liked the northerners he said but he was loyal to the southern cause and listened with flashing eyes and crimson cheeks to all he continually heard of the sure defeat and disgrace of the confederacy matters were in this wise when the day came on which annie was expected home with jimmy great preparations had been made for that arrival in rockland there was more than one prisoner who had been nursed by annie graham and her name was spoken with reverence and love by the veriest vagabond that walked the streets 
they had not made a demonstration in a long long time but they were going to make one now and the honours which poor george saw in fancy awarded to himself were to be given to his wife jimmy too whose terrible sufferings had excited so much commiseration was to have his share of consideration bill baker who had been home for a week and was as usual the most active spirit of all suggested that when they flung out the banner on which was inscribed honour and welcome to annie graham they should give three cheers for mr carleton too bein as he said that they are about as good as one prompt to the moment when it was due the train swept round the rockland curve and stopped at the depot where a large concourse of people was gathered they had not expected the widow sims and when her green veil and straw bonnet appeared on the platform the foremost of the group looked a little disappointed while the widow's face darkened as she saw the waiting multitude and guessed why they were there annie had appeared by this time and at sight of her the tongues were loosened and deafening shouts of welcome greeted her on every side the flag bearing her name was held aloft the cannon in the adjoining field sent forth its bellowing roar and the band struck up the sweet refrain of annie laurie while the voices of the andersonville prisoners who had been annie's charge sang the last line and for bonnie annie graham i would lay me down and die surely this was a coming home which annie had never looked for and with her face flushed with excitement and her eyes shining with tears she stood in the midst of the shouting throng gazing wonderingly from one to the other and realizing nothing clearly except the firm clasp upon her arm it was jimmy's hand and jimmy himself leaned upon her as the crowd coupled his name with hers and hurrahed for james carleton and annie graham and the widder sims i swan if it's fair to leave her out she did some tall nossin down to annapolis bill baker said and then the widow was cheered and she acknowledged the compliment with a grim smile and wondered when folks would quit makin fools of themselves and if susan wasn't up there somewhere in the jam of course she was twas like them rugglesses to go where the doins was and while she shook the hand of her neighbours she kept her eyes on the watch for susan and felt a little chagrined that she did not find her susan was at home in the neat little house which john had bought with his captain's wages so carefully saved the same house it was at which annie graham had looked with longing eyes in the commencement of the war and in the pleasant chamber which overlooked the town there was a little boy who had been in rockland only a week and whose existence was yet unknown to the widow they had purposely kept it from her so she had no suspicion that he was expected and the first genuine feeling of happiness she had known since isaac died she experienced when she was ushered into susan's room and the little red-faced thing was laid in her lap she had looked askance at the new house and neat furniture and the pretty curtains as so many proofs of them rugglesses extravagance but she was not proof against the white face which from the pillow smiled so kindly upon her and called her mother and she was guilty of kissing her daughter-in-law even before she saw the baby her first grandchild whom susan called isaac although she hated the name and had tacked on to it adolphus with the hope that the future would adjust the name into adolph or something more fanciful than the good plain bible isaac and while the widow kissed and wept over her grandson and felt herself growing young and soft and gentle again the crowd around the depot had dispersed a part going to their own homes and a part following the soldiers and band which escorted annie graham and jimmy carleton to the mather mansion where everything had been made so beautiful for them it was a pleasant coming home and a most ample compensation for all the weariness and privation which annie as hospital nurse had endured and she felt that far more was awarded to her than she deserved mr carleton was the one to be honoured she said and her soft blue eyes rested upon the pale tired man who exhausted with his journey and the excitement lay down at once upon the sofa while his mother and rose knelt beside him and kissed and pitied and cried over his poor white face and long bony hands which were almost transparent in their whiteness maud was not one of the party at the mather mansion that night you ought to be alone the first night she said when rose insisted that she should join them to-morrow i will come round and call on mrs graham and your brother she had been greatly interested in all the arrangements and was curious to see the woman who had almost been her rival while annie was quite as curious to see her the heroine of the mountains in her letters to annie rose had purposely refrained from mentioning tom's name with maud's so that annie was ignorant of the real state of things 
but she did not remain so long is she so very beautiful she said to rose when after supper they were all assembled in the parlor and maud was the subject of conversation ask tom he can tell you rose replied and by the conscious look on tom's face annie guessed the truth at once that night when the two brothers were alone in their room tom said to jimmy well my boy i've kept my word i've waited a year and more i've given you every chance a reasonable man could ask have you made a proper use of your privileges would it do me any good to try and win annie now you can try if you like jimmy said with a smile and then tom told him of his hopes concerning maud de vere and jimmy said to him saucily don't you remember i told you once you had had your day but some lucky dogs have too and you it seems are one of them thirty eight the lovers the next day brought maud de vere looking so handsome in her black dress with her coquettish drab hat and long drab feather tipped with scarlet that she reminded annie of some bright tropical flower as she came into the room with the sparkle in her brilliant eyes and the deep rich bloom upon her cheek she had regained her health and spirits rapidly within the last few weeks and even jimmy who seldom saw beyond annie's fair face and soft blue eyes drew a breath of wonder at the queenly girl who completely overshadowed those around her so far as size and form and physical development were concerned but nothing could detract from the calm quiet dignity of annie's manner or from the pure angelic beauty of her face and as the two stood holding each other's hands and looking into each other's eyes they made a most striking tableau and mrs carleton thought with a thrill of pride how well her sons had chosen that night as maud was walking back to the hotel accompanied by tom he asked her again the question put in the cave of the cumberland i understand about arthur he said but he is dead there is no promise now in the way i claim you for my own am i wrong in doing so that maud's reply was wholly satisfactory was proved by the expression of tom carleton's face when at last he stopped at the door of the hotel and by the kiss which burned on maud's lips long after he had disappeared down the street the next afternoon while tom was with maud and both mrs carleton and rose were out on a shopping expedition annie sat alone with jimmy in the pleasant little room which had been given to him as a place where he would be more quiet than in the parlour annie had been playing with rose's boy the little jimmy a handsome sturdy fellow of nearly a year old whom the entire household spoiled he was already beginning to talk and having taken a fancy to annie he tried to call her name and made out of it a tolerably distinct ante which brought a blush to annie's face and a teasing smile to jimmy's come sit by me a moment annie jimmy said when the child had been taken out by his nurse sit on this stool so a little nearer to me there that's right he continued in the tone of authority he had unconsciously acquired since his convalescence he was lying upon the couch and annie was sitting at his side and so near to him that his long fingers could smooth and caress her shining hair while his saucy eyes feasted themselves upon her face as he asked when she really would be the auntie of the little boy who called her by that name not till you are able to stand alone was annie's reply and then for the first time since his return from andersonville jimmy spoke of that episode in his life at new london when little lulu howard had stirred his boyish blood and filled his boyish fancy perhaps he wanted to tease annie for he said to her i did like that little blue-eyed lou that's a fact i used to think about her all day and dream about her all night i wonder where she is now what would you do if you knew annie asked and jimmy replied i believe i would go miles to see her just to know what kind of a woman she has developed into i trust she is not like her aunt i could not endure her she struck me as a hard selfish ambitious woman terribly afraid lest the world generally should not think mrs scott belknap all which mrs scott belknap thought herself to be annie's cheeks were very red by this time and imputing her heightened colour to a cause widely different from the real one jimmy drew her face down to his and kissing the burning cheek said of course i should take you with me when i went after little lou you would hardly find her if you did not annie said while jimmy looked inquiringly at her annie had only been waiting for jimmy to speak of the little pequot before making her own confession and she now said to him abruptly 
did lulu look any like me why yes i've always thought so only she was younger and had short hair you know and short dresses too annie annie tell me was she do you are you jimmy began raising himself upright upon the couch as something in annie's expression began to puzzle and mystify him am i what annie asked am i little lulu of the pequot house my name was annie louise howard before i married george my aunt called me louise you never inquired my maiden name i believe i suppose you thought i had always been a married woman but i was a girl of fourteen once and went with my aunt belknap to london and met a boy who called himself dick lee and who was so kind to the orphan girl that she began to think of him all day and watch for his coming after his school hours he was a saucy teasing boy but lulu liked him and when one day she waited for his promised coming till it grew dark upon the beach and the great hotel was lighted up for the evening festivity and when other days and nights passed and he neither came nor sent her any word and she heard at last from one of his comrades that he had gone home to boston i say when all this came about she began to think that she had loved the boy who deceived her so for he did deceive her in more points than one as she afterward learned his name was not dick lee but annie jimmy began and annie stopped him saying wait jimmy till i am through this is my hour now i have delayed telling you all this for various reasons your mother knew who i was before i went to washington and she excused you as far as was possible that i have promised to be your wife is proof that i have forgiven the pangs of disappointment i endured for jimmy i did suffer for a time there was so little in the world to make me happy and you had been so kind that i fully believed in and trusted you and when i found i was deceived my heart ached as hard perhaps as the heart of a girl of fourteen can ache from such a cause poor annie poor little lulu jimmy said as he clasped one of annie's hands in his own and his voice expressed all the sorrow and tenderness he felt for annie who continued such childish loves are usually short-lived you know but mine was the first pleasant dream i had known since my parents died and i went to my aunt belknap in new haven she meant to be kind i suppose and in a certain way she was she gave me a good education and every advantage within her means she took me to newport and saratoga and the new york hotels and she turned her back on george graham whom we met at long branch where he was making some repairs upon an engine a mechanic was not her idea of a husband for her niece she preferred that i should marry a man of sixty who had already the portraits of three wives in his handsome house at meriden but then for each portrait he counted over two hundred thousand dollars and a half a million covers a multitude of defects and a great many wives i would not marry that man and as the result of my persistent refusal my life with my aunt became so unbearable that when providence again threw george in my way and he asked me to be his wife i consented and i never regretted the step he was very kind to me and i loved him so much that when he died i thought my heart died too for he was my all annie was very beautiful in her excitement as she paid this tribute to her deceased husband and jimmy saw that she was beautiful but felt relieved when she left george graham and spoke of rose who had come to her like an angel of light and made the burden easier to bear i had no suspicion that she was the soi-disant dick lee's sister or that my boy hero was not dick lee until just before you came home for the first time and then i thought i must go away for i did not care to meet you but rose prevented me and i am glad now that she did and i am glad too jimmy said your staying has been the means of untold good to me darling it was the memory of your sweet holy life and character which led me a wretch at andersonville to seek the saviour whom you have loved so long god has led us both in strange paths we have suffered a great deal you mentally i physically and only what i deserved but let us hope that the night is past and the morning of our happy future dawning upon us we are both young yet you twenty-three and i only twenty-six we have a long life to look forward to and i thank god for it but most of all i thank him for giving me my darling annie my dear little lulu does rose know that you are lulu 
mrs carleton had thought it better not to add to rose's excitement by telling her who annie was while jimmy's fate was shrouded in so much gloom then after his return she decided that annie should have the satisfaction of telling herself and thus rose was still in ignorance with regard to annie's identity with the pequot but annie told her that night and rose's eyes were like stars as she smothered annie with kisses and declared it was all like some strange story she had read End of chapters 37 and 38chapter thirty nine of rose mather by mary jane holmes this librivox recording is in the public domain thirty nine charlie he did not improve as his sister and uncle hoped he might and as the cold weather increased they began to talk of taking him to a warmer climate but charlie said i am as well here as i could be anywhere i don't want to be moved about let me stay here in quiet so they made him as comfortable as possible at the hotel and rose and annie came every day to see him and he learned to watch and listen for their coming especially that of annie to whom he took the kindliest she knew just how to nurse him and as she once cared for the poor prisoners so she now cared for the southern boy who while acknowledging the kindness of the northern people was still as thorough a secessionist as he had ever been anxiously he waited for daily news of the progress of grant's army refusing to believe that lee was so closely shut up in richmond that escape was impossible blindly like many of his older brethren he clung to the hope that underlying the whole was some hidden motive which would in time appear and work good to his cause maud never opposed or disputed with him now but read him every little item of good for the south but when in the spring the fighting at petersburg commenced there were no such items to read and charlie asked no longer for news then there came a never-to-be-forgotten day when through the length and breadth of the land the glad tidings ran that richmond had fallen that lee with his army was flying from the city with grant in hot pursuit the war was virtually over and from maine to oregon the air was filled with the jubilant notes of victory for three long hours the bells of rockland rang out their merry peals and at night they kindled bonfires in the streets and on the grass plat by the well in widow sim's yard they burned the box which four years before poor isaac had put away for just such an occasion as this all the morning of that memorable monday while the bells were ringing and the crowds were shouting in the streets charlie de vere had lain with his white face to the wall and his lips quivering with the grief and mortification he felt that it should have ended thus occasionally as the shouts grew louder he stopped his ears so as to shut out what seemed to him like exultations over the death of so many hopes but when annie came in and told maud of the bonfire they were to have that night in mrs sim's yard and asked her to come for the sake of the boy whose box was to be burned charlie began to listen and as he listened he grew interested in isaac sims and the grass plat by the well and the box hidden in the barn and he expressed a wish to be present when it was burned maud too had heard of isaac sims before she knew that he had been captured by arthur turnbridge but she did not know the particulars of his prison life or how generously tom had sacrificed his chance of liberty for the sake of the poor sick boy until annie told the story to which she listened with swimming eyes and a heart throbbing with love and respect for her lover who had been so noble and unselfish she would go to the bonfire on the grass plat she said and charlie should go too he had wept passionately at the recital of isaac's sufferings in libby but still found some excuse for the south generally it was not the better class of people he said who did these things it was the lower ignorant ones whose instincts were naturally brutal and neither maud nor annie contradicted him though the eyes of the former flashed indignantly and her nostrils quivered as they always did when the sufferings of our prisoners were mentioned in her presence that night when the stars came out over rockland a party of twelve or more was congregated at the house of the widow sims where but for the sad memory of isaac whose soldier coat hung on the wall with a knapsack carried into battle all would have been joy and hilarity at the prospect of certain peace but death had been in that household just as it had crept across many and many another threshold and mingled with the rejoicing were tears and sad regrets for the dead of our land whose graves were everywhere from the shadowy forests of maine and the vast prairies of the west to the sunny plains of the south where they fought and died 
there were twenty-five buried in the rockland graveyard and others than the party assembled at mrs sims thought of the vacant chairs at home and the sleeping dead whose ears were deaf to the notes of peace floating so musically over the land charlie's face was very white and there were tears in his eyes as he laid his thin white hands reverently upon the box examining its make and bending close to the name and date and words cut upon it isaac sims rockland april twenty fifth eighteen sixty one this box to be burned there was a blank which the boy who had cut the words with his jack-knife could not supply he did not know when the box would be burned then it was april eighteen sixty one now it was april eighteen sixty five four years of strife and bloodshed thousands and thousands of desolate hearthstones and broken hearts and lifeless forms both north and south and the end had come at last but the boy isaac was not there to see it it was not for him to fill up that blank but for the southern boy charlie de vere who took his pencil from his pocket and wrote april third eighteen sixty five to celebrate the fall of richmond and the end of the confederacy charles de vere who shall light the pile tom asked when all was ready and charlie answered let me please surely i may light the fire and he did light it and then with the rest looked on while the smoke and the flames curled up toward the starry heavens where the boy isaac had gone and where charlie in his dreams that night saw him so distinctly and grasped his friendly hand after that night charlie failed rapidly and often in his sleep he talked to someone who seemed to be arthur and said it was a mistake a dreadful mistake at last as maud sat by him one day the fifth after the bonfire on the grass plat he said to her suddenly maud if a man kills another and didn't mean to is it murder no it is manslaughter why do you ask maud said and charlie continued don't hate me maud nor tell anybody for i killed arthur myself i shot him right through the head and maud he thought it was you oh charlie charlie and maud shrieked aloud as she bent over her brother who continued not when he died but at first when he lay there on the grass moaning and looking at you so sorry and grieved like don't you remember yes maud gasped and charlie went on you know that one of the ruffians fired at captain carleton and hit you and then i could not help paying him back he was taller than arthur who stood behind him and knocked him down in time to take the ball himself he knew you had a revolver and he thought it was you though an accident of course and it made him so sorry that you should be the one to kill him but i told him different when i whispered to him you know i said it was i and his eyes put on such a happy look i know he forgave me for he said so but my heart has ached ever since with thinking about it i could not forget it and i've asked god to forgive me so many times i think he has and that when i die i shall go where isaac sims has gone i like him maud if he was a yankee and fought against us and i like mrs graham so much and mr james carleton and the mathers and mrs sims some but i can't like that dreadful bill baker with his slang words and vulgar ways he makes me so sick and i feel so ashamed that we should be beaten by such as he you were not beaten by such as he you are mistaken charlie the northern army was composed of many of the noblest men in the world there are bill bakers everywhere as many south as north it is foolish to think otherwise maud was growing hot and eloquent in her defence of the northern army but charlie's gentle low-spoken reply stopped her perhaps it is i got terribly perplexed thinking it all over and how it has turned out i think yes i know i am glad the negroes are free we never abused them uncle paul never abused them but there were those who did and if slavery is a divine institution as we were taught to believe it was a broken down and badly conducted institution and not at all as god meant it to be managed charlie paused a moment and when he spoke again it was of tom who had been so kind to him he is like a brother to me maud and i am glad you are to be his wife and maud don't wait after i am dead but marry captain carleton at once you will be happier then with tears and kisses maud bent over her brother 
who after that confession seemed so much brighter and more cheerful that hope sometimes whispered to maud that he would live annie was almost constantly with him now he felt better and stronger with her he said and death was not so terrible so just as she had soothed and comforted and nursed many a poor fellow from andersonville annie comforted and nursed charlie de vere until that dreadful saturday when the telegraphic wires brought up from the south the appalling news that our president was dead murdered by the assassin's hand no no not that we did not do that charlie cried with a look of horror in his blue eyes when he heard the dreadful story and that the southern leaders were suspected of complicity in the murder it would make me a unionist if i believed my people capable of that but they are not it cannot be charlie kept repeating to himself while the great drops of sweat stood upon his white forehead and his pulse and heart beat so rapidly that maud summoned the attending physician who shook his head doubtfully at the great change for the worse in his patient i had hoped at least to keep him till the warm weather but i am afraid those bells will be the death of him he said as he saw how charlie shivered and moaned with each sound of the tolling bells perhaps they would stop if you were to ask them and tell them why annie suggested to maud but charlie who heard it exclaimed no let them toll on it is proper they should mourn for him the south would do the same if it was our president who had been murdered so the bells tolled on and the public buildings were draped in mourning and the windows of charlie's room were festooned with black and he watched the sombre drapery as it swayed in the april wind and talked of the terrible deed and the war which was ended and the world to which so many thousands had gone during the long four years of strife and bloodshed i shall be there to-morrow he said and then perhaps i shall know why all this has been done and if we were so wrong maud and annie paul haverell and tom carleton watched him through the night and just as the beautiful easter morning broke and the sunlight fell upon the rockland hills the boy who to the last had remained true to the southern cause lay dead among the people who had been his foes at maud's request they buried him by the side of isaac sims and captain carleton ordered a handsome monument on which the names of both the boys were cut isaac sims who had died for the north and charlie de vere who if need be would have given his life for the south each holding entirely different political sentiments but both holding the same living faith which made for them an entrance to the world where all is perfect peace and where we who now see through a glass darkly shall then see face to face and know why these things are so six months had passed since charlie de vere died paul haverell will mather and captain carleton had been together on a pilgrimage to paul's old neighbourhood where the people wiser grown welcomed back their old friend and neighbour and strove in various ways to atone for all which had been cruel and harsh in their former dealing toward him the war had left them destitute so far as negroes and money were concerned but such as they had they freely offered paul entreating him to stay in their midst and rebuild the homestead whose blackened ruins bore testimony to what men's passions will lead them to do when roused and uncontrolled but paul said no he could never again live where there was so much to remind him of the past a little way out of nashville was a beautiful dwelling-house which with a few acres of highly cultivated land was offered for sale maud had spoken of the place when she was in the city and had said i should like to live there and tom had remembered it and when he found it for sale he suggested to mr haverell that they buy it as a winter residence for maud and so what little property paul haverell had left was invested in fair oaks as the place was called and tom gave orders that the house should be refurnished and ready for himself and bride as early as the first of november as far as was possible will and tom found and generously rewarded those who had so kindly befriended them in their perilous journey across the mountains but some were missing and only their graves remained to tell the story of their wrongs this trip was made in june and early in august the whole carleton family went to new london where jimmy improved so fast that few would have recognized the pale thin invalid of andersonville notoriety in the active red-cheeked saucy-eyed young man who became the life of the pequot house and for whom the gay bells practised their most bewitching coquetries but these were all lost on jimmy who was seldom many minutes away from the fair blue-eyed woman who the girls had learned was a widow and of whom they at first had no fears 
but they changed their minds when day after day saw the handsome carlton at her side and night after night found him walking with her along the road or sitting on the rocks and watching the tide come in just as he had done years ago when both were younger than they were now they lived those days over again and in their perfect happiness almost forgot the sorrow and pain which had come to them both since they first looked out upon the waters of new london bay tom and maud were there too together with rose mather and will and susan sims and john a well-timed investment in oil stock a lucky turn of the wheel and captain john sims awoke one morning with one hundred thousand dollars he did not believe it at first and susan did not believe it either but when john who with all his good sense was a little given to show or as his mother expressed it to making a fool of himself brought her a set of diamonds handsomer than rose mathers and bought her a new carriage and took her to saratoga with an english nurse for little ike she began to realize that something had happened to her which brought rose mathers envied style of living within her means she soon grew tired of saratoga she was too much alone in that great crowd and when she heard that the carletons were at new london she went there with her diamonds and horses and patronized by rose who took her at once under her protection she made a few pleasant acquaintances and ever after talked confidently of her summer at the seaside she did not care to go again however she and john were not exactly like people born to high life she said and so she settled quietly down in her pretty home and made as the widow sim said quite a decent woman considering she was one of them rugglesses bill baker was astir very early one bright october morning his face indicating that some important event was pending in which he was to act a part it was a double wedding at st luke's and maud and annie were the brides there was a great crowd to witness the ceremony and annie's boys whom she had nursed at annapolis were the first to offer their congratulations to mrs james carleton who looked so fair and pure and lovely while maud whose beauty was of a more brilliant order seemed to sparkle and flash as she bent her stately head in response to the greetings given to her upon bill who had turned hack driver devolved the honor of taking the bridal party to and from the church and his horses were covered with the federal flag while conspicuous in his buttonhole was a small one made of white silk and presented to him by a girl whom he called m and who blushed every time she heard bill's voice ordering the crowd to stand back and his horses to show their oats as he drove from the church with the newly married people their destination was nashville where in maud's beautiful home jimmy and annie passed a few delightful weeks and then returned to boston to the old carleton house on beacon street which had been fitted up for their reception mrs carleton senior divides her time between her three children tom jimmy and rose but her home proper is with annie in boston where there is now a little lulu graham six months old and where rose and will often go while each summer tom carleton comes up from fair oaks with his beautiful maud the heroine of the cumberland mountains End of chapter thirty nine. End of Rose Mather by Mary Jane Holmes. Recorded by Cillian Major.